Hello and welcome to the Classic Rangefinder podcast. My name is Simon <laughs> Forster and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Uh, hello, Johnny. <laughs> good, good morning, Simon. Hello, Perry. <laughs> hello. I'm going to sign off now. and um, <laughs> But before I do that, um, I just want to say thank you to Mike Ekman for coming along uh, last week and uh, resoundingly beating us um, in the Classic Lenses pub quiz. Uh, fairly and squarely, uh, I, I must add. Not not like what happened when, when the, the other Mike came along and, and well... I'm not bitter or anything about losing out to, to, to Mike Novak, but, you know. Um, but anyway, um, we have a guest on today's show, so I'm going to head over to Chicago and head over to Johnny. So uh, take it away, Johnny. Good good morning from sunny Chicago. It's it's wonderful here today. <laughs> so thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, with us today, I'm really excited about this. Um, uh, we have Dan Tamarkin with us, who uh, anybody who knows Chicago and knows anything about photography or cameras about Chicago probably knows, has heard of two places. One is Central Camera, obviously, from me, because I'm here always talking about that, but also uh, Tamarkin camera. So um, the, so I guess you have the two, two uh, Leica representatives <laughs> As as it would be from Chicago here, one from the I would say the oldest dealer, and quite fairly so I would say from the premier like a dealer, not just in Chicago, but in the United States and one of the premier like a dealers in the world. I don't think there's anybody who would dispute that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we are super excited to have Dan Tamarkin here, and we're going to just talk about everything Leica and everything rangefinder and. Um, I think we're, you know, we're all a gregarious group, so we'll just see where everything goes. Um, but just by way of very brief introduction, um, I, I probably really what I've already just said, um, uh, Tamark, Tamarkin is, uh, you, you know, known far and wide as being um, uh, one of the premier Leica dealers and one of one of the most knowledgeable places you you could turn to if you were interested in in getting into the world of like a photography so um that's about all i'm going to say i want to turn it over to dan to to tell us a little bit about um background history what they do talk about the auction talk about the gallery all that great stuff that um is unique to tamark and camera so Dan, hello. Hi Good there. morning. Good How, morning. Where, where are you in Chicago? Are you are you in town here as well? Or are you? I am. Yeah? I am. I'm, I'm on the northwest side of Chicago in Portage Park. Oh, okay. Um, so I could it's... throw I could throw cameras at you from where I am. In, <laughs> right, in park. right. So we're oh, okay. Close. Yeah, we're close by. Yeah, exactly, exactly. We can we can have a, a lens cap exchange program, like right? Harry exactly. Yeah. or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I am, uh, let me see, what can I say? I am a Leica nut. I'm a camera nerd, uh, a Leica nut, um, uh, a teller of stories, a salesman of all things Leica, an auctioneer, uh, a little bit of everything. Um, so I'm based in Chicago. Um, I have a, a small um store that sells exclusively Leica cameras, which are both rangefinder cameras and and SLRs and DSLRs and film and digital. And in that um, store in downtown Chicago is also a small gallery. I'm actually only about a mile or so, maybe a mile and a half from Johnny's uh, Mm -hmm. central camera, um, which I love to visit. It's one of the best camera stores in the, I mean, well, to say it's one of the best camera stores in the city of Chicago doesn't go very far anymore. Because <laughs> right, unfortunately. <laughs> but but even when there were all of those camera stores in, right. in Chicago, um, in, including, you know, the Ritz and the Wolf and Shoe Town and all these different ca- uh, camera stores, Central Camera really stood out, especially with that big marquee, which I'd love to have a big marquee like that. But anyway, yeah. my little store is uh, is about a mile west of Central Camera. We have a small gallery where we typically hang about 20 to 25 images, nothing gigantic, usually about 17, 22 or 16, 20. We have a few showcases of classic Leica cameras. Um, and we have, uh, I think the earliest camera that we have in the store is probably from the late 1800s, but Leica camera, the earliest camera that we have, 
currently in the stores from 1926 mm. all the way up to the currently manufactured digital range finders and, and mirrorless and all, all that good stuff. And, and so, um, and so that's, that's, that's where I can be found in, uh, also to Uh, that's right. where I can be found in what I do. Um, I, my background is actually in theater and in writing. I went to UIC here in Chicago and have a degree in writing with a minor in linguistics, which doesn't really do anything for me in the photographic world. Um, but it was a good education to get. So, um, when my father who founded to camera in 1971, when my father went to retire in 2010, he's like, I'm going to play golf, Danny. You do whatever you want to do. You just make sure the checks land on my desk every month and we'll be okay. So, um, and so I took over this, which is essentially the family company and uh, moved it to Chicago. And that was in, that was in, uh, I took over in 2010 and moved the company to Chicago in 2012. And so we've been here in downtown Chicago, um, since that time we started in new Haven, Connecticut in the house that I grew up in and, um, uh, uh, and then branched out to New York and then eventually now Chicago. Yeah. And yeah. when I was, uh, when I was about three years old, this is my introduction to photography. Okay. When I was about three years old, my father brought back a like junky camera that he got from some swap meet. With, uh, and he gave it to me in my playpen, you know, and I, I beat the thing up and I reduced it to a pile <laughs> of scrap metal and screws. And uh, now, you know, nowadays that camera um, is worth a few thousand dollars. It was a Rectiflex, actually. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really valuable camera, this particular one. So my, my dad doesn't like to let me forget that. But that was my that was my introduction to photography. <laughs> oh, wow. Great. Um so, so family business, yep. uh, it's in the blood, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, my mother was an actress, is an actress, and my father's a camera salesman. So I got, I got a little of both. You got to do, and you get to, you get to use both, both, uh, both talents in your day to day. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I wanted to ask you just real quick? I mean, and we'll, we'll get into everything, but uh, you know, the realities of our present situation, how has, um, how has everything changed for you since I guess about March and how are things going with, you know, COVID and just managing working through all that. And I mean, obviously it's a different way of doing business. You're used to having people just walk in the door and, you know, um, so I'm sure things are a little bit different. And I just, you know, we, we like to just get a gauge of how people are doing and what's going on and, and how is, how are things functioning for you that were maybe different and, you know, where are things going these days? Yeah, thank you for asking. It's um, it's it's interesting. It's interesting for everybody, I think, in all of their jobs and and everything that we do has changed and shifted enough that we can all we all have some way to weigh in, some story yeah. to tell about what this has been. Um, we have typically been a mail order camera dealership, um, uh, and no matter what happens with things like sales tax, um, people love to buy stuff from their, you know, from their homes and online. And although we don't have an online shopping cart, um, we have been pretty busy. Um, I'm happy and grateful to say throughout this uh, pandemic. And a lot of it has to do with people sitting at home, looking around, playing with camera gear and realizing, gee, they really do need another lens. Or it's about time that I sold uncle, you know, uncle Harry's camera gear. That's been cluttering up the, yeah. the closet. And then, you know, I'll tell you one thing that happened. I'll tell you, here's one thing that happened that is definitely a new thing for us is we get a lot of calls about people wanting to sell camera gear. Here's one of the calls that I got. Okay. Hey, um, hey, how are you? I was like, okay, I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm all right. Um, look, you, uh, you, uh, you buy cameras. And I said, well, we buy certain cameras. What, what kind of camera do you have to sell? Uh, gee, I don't know. I just figure, well, if you guys buy cameras, well, I'll go get some cameras. So that was a camera. <laughs> that was, a that was a, one of the, one of the pandemic. I, I think what I think that was a pandemic related call. Um, and there's lots of stuff like, is my camera broken? I don't know. What kind of camera do you have? Um, the, you know, what's my camera worth? 
Um, I have 17 Polaroids that have been in my closet and they're nice and mildewed. How much will you pay? <laughs> so there's, you know, all, there's all of that kind of stuff, but really weird to market myself personally and also professionally have been really super fortunate during this pandemic. I mean, it's a really crazy time. Definitely business has been slower um, because, you know, folks are out of work and not everybody is buying um, and buying recreationally. Um, so it has been real slow, but because of mail order, we, we don't really, we didn't really get a lot of walk-ins to begin with. I mean, people yeah. see the red dot, the like a red dot on the sign outside and they get a little feverish, you know, people get a little anxious and itchy when they see that red dot. Cause it's, it's, it should be an exciting thing to go into a camera store. These, these places that are hardly uh, ever around anymore. Yeah. Um, and especially if you are indeed shopping for a, a new camera, whether it's a Leica or a, or a Holga, it doesn't matter. It should be an exciting and fun experience. And so that kind of thing has really waned very much in the last few months. And certainly gallery goers are non-existent. Right. Understandably so. I mean, we, we uh, have been quarantining and, and operating from our homes until the beginning of July. Mm-hmm. And then um, we've been preparing for a rare camera auction which our sister company to mark and auctions does every November. And so the, nothing was going to stop me from that. And so yeah. we kind of reopened in the beginning of July, but we um, we've been kind of just chugging along, thankfully. And yeah. answering some crazy calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, I think usually the difference probably Dan is those people wouldn't bother calling central camera. They would just show up. And they God would show up with, <laughs> and they would show up with all those mildewed cameras from the closet, and we would have to go through and try to explain, mm. you know, mm-hmm. what was worth two dollars and fifty cents, and what was maybe worth a little bit more. And mm. so, yeah, it's that's always exciting. Oh yeah, well, I had <laughs> I had kind of a seasonal employee a couple years back who was wonderful, and she said, you know, I, I love doing this work because you always kind of discover like little gems or usually hopefully discover little gems yeah, in this, yeah. you know, bin of mildewed stuff that we're going through. But she's like, I think I'd like to have some masks and gloves. <laughs> so I got on the PPE train a couple years ago. That's when, amazing. <laughs> yeah. When she started working for me and it was funny because like, and she wasn't like bunched up about it, but she just, she just said very, very frankly and very plainly, she's like, I really think that would be a good idea. And so then she went on to bigger and better things and uh, then going through mildew camera bins and in doing so left behind this PPE, these gloves and masks. And so in the middle of March, when everybody was kind of freaking out about toilet paper and masks and, and, and garbanzo beans and what else, whatever <laughs> else people were freaking out about, um, I had this huge supply of masks and gloves, which I found on a shelf that she had left behind. So really things turned out quite well for us in the middle of March. (laughs) That's amazing. (laughs) And then I had, you know, I brought home, we, we, we were quarantining. So I was bringing home to my home office more and more and more camera Mm. gear so that I could be taking photographs of this stuff and have it in hand to describe to people who would call and, right. And, you know, and ask about, you know, the condition of the M3 and all of this and, or, or whatever it is. And they would, you know, you have to have the item there to be able to talk about it. And so uh, my dining room table just got completely full of cameras. It got to be really problematic, but that was really the worst part of it. Worst part of it. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the, the, the used camera world is, is interesting for sure. Um, (laughs) So I, I, I can only imagine. And it's, you know, I've always been curious about that, you know, because obviously you specialize and central is more of a generalist, right? Um, Right. So the fact that you specialize, you, you, I imagine you, you can screen a lot of that stuff kind of before it, it turns up as it were. Um, I'm sure you still get a lot of other things that turn up. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that's true, Johnny. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. It's true. Um, Yeah. And we, we do enjoy a little bit of that. It's like having a, it's like having a, you know, it's like the, you know, it's screening your calls. It's like yeah. screening your calls is right. what it's like. Right. It's terrible. I never thought of it like that, but it's true. Hey, well, John, you, John, John yeah. just a just a quick one there. When when people, I mean, you can't do it quite at the moment, but I'm just wondering if you in the future, if if this opportunity arises when somebody walks in with random gear, uh, whether you ask them the question, "Did Dan send you?" 
and just see just how many of those people actually happen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. With kind of like a John to die. Like, uh, <laughs> well, so, sometimes actually, I know that they have talked to Dan. It's, yeah. I mean, you know, it, 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 no, but I mean, honestly, we it, we we rec- we send people to Tabarkin all the time if we don't have something. That's Likewise. Tabarkin. Likewise, yeah, right. and we know that. I mean, it's and a lot of people will will say that up front that oh, you know, Dan sent me over. I talk, you know, so that's that's very common. It's you know, w- we do different enough things that you know, it's not. There's really not a lot of overlap. And actually, sometimes yeah. when there is, it's actually really helpful because you know, you might have something or Don might have something, and you've got a customer that needs it, right? So it's oh, like yeah. there's a lot of working together. The collaborative part of it oh, is, absolutely. is great. So, and my father and Don go way back. Yes, yeah, so that's just what I wanted. That one of the things I want to ask you about as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, like my, so my father started this business in 1971 when it was a handshake and letter writing and meetings wow. annually, and you know there was no. You know, you talk on the telephone and, and there was like the Leica Hysterical, Historical Society <laughs> um, of America, which, which I'm a, a, a director of and is a super fun group and I recommend highly. The Leica Historical Society of America. It's, now it's known as the International Leica Society because we had to like kind of branch out a little bit. Yeah. But it's still known as the LHSA. And so um, he was an LHSA member and there would be meetings in the spring and in the fall. And, and it was really it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of camaraderie there. You have historians, you have shooters, you have shooter historians, you have, you know, people who just want to show off their like a bling. There's, you know, a little bit of everyone. Yeah. And, and so that's when, that's when it got started and it got started over a handshake and, and at camera shows, do you remember these? There used to be camera shows and yeah. people would go to, and there still are. Um, and actually in a way they'd become bigger and brighter because they're like the only game in town, you know, like, so there's so few camera shows that they get bigger and bigger, you know, or mm-hmm. at least that's my impression. Um, and you get more and more junk. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, there's, there's lots and lots of stuff that's really I should I shouldn't say it like that. There's some extremely affordable stuff at <laughs> right. at, at swap meets and, and camera. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to sound like a like a snob because I'm not. I'm actually surrounded by folding cameras, which I love. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, not everything is a Leica. Not everything is a Leica for me. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you my I'll tell you my 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 Leica secrets later in the show. <laughs> but um, but anyway, the, the Tamarkin camera began like a lot of companies that have uh, been around for a little while began, which is on a handshake and a telephone call and eye to eyeball to eyeball and camera shows. And so at camera shows, which are an awful lot of fun, you get to discover all these, you know, w- weird old cameras that you would never have, you know, never have seen before. And these camera, different camera parts and, and features and filters and all kinds of different stuff. And it's really fantastic. And, and that I think is is going to be slow to start up again. And I'm really looking forward to it. Mm, yeah. I, 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 I've been thinking about the same thing. I mean, the, really the, the only show that was still local here in Chicago was the Photorama shows, which happened, I don't know yeah. what, two or two or three times a year. Um, and, and it, you know, and it, it's, it is sad because they, I have noticed over the past, let's say five years or so that, they were really starting to dwindle to the point you're like thinking, I, I mean, how much longer are they going to do this? There's only, yeah. you know, there's, there's eight old guys here with camera stuff and there's a few people walking through, but I mean, over the past few years, they, uh, they've been much more popular. There are more oh, yeah. people, more young people, um, more people selling. So, I mean, that, that actually is kind of really encouraging. There seems to be this resurgence of interest um, as you know, as younger folks have really gotten into film. Um, and I mean, it's the same with central it, you know, there, there's been a definite upswing in, in traffic, just, you know, people getting into film. Yeah. So, so that part is really encouraging and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that, that will, uh, continue or come back or return after, after all this. So. Yeah, me too. I mean, I think that it's, I think that it's one of those things that it's like uh, an insatiable thing. I think it's yeah. a, it, for human beings. I mean, I think that the arts generally are theater, you know, whether it's dance or painting or theater or photography or any of that kind of stuff. I think that it's something that people will always gravitate to uh, on some level. 
And it, it's very helpful that we have, you know, this fabulous university town with, with Columbia and, yes. and, and a bunch of photographic programs. Um, and so there's lots of, you know, fresh meat, uh, young bloods that are coming in and, you know, people that are coming in and doing their thing. There's, there are people who are doing wet plate photography and tin types and all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. It's really, it's awesome. Yeah. It, 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 re- it really is. And, and, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's all going to kind of continue forward because it's not like an, in, it's not the sort of thing where it's an interest that is going to die because of this. People are able to do it at home away from, you know, in a way that's the great thing about it. You can, you know, it, it's, you, you can do it on your own terms. So, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I have no doubt it will survive all this. It's just, you know, I'm sure business will be a little bit different. Um, obviously it'd be very different for central, but, um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's yeah. uh I I'm 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 hopeful that that you know, people are still going to want to get together and do those sort of things when they can. So something to look forward to. I think so. I agree. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Hey Dan, uh I I speak I have a question about the uh LHSA that you mentioned <clears throat> earlier. Yes. Um I a couple of years ago my girlfriend and I were on a trip in Germany in the summer and uh we made a little stopover to the like a headquarters in Wetzlar. And that was an awesome trip, but yeah. just purely coincidentally while we were, cause we were there to, to just, you know, check out the place and also meet with the archivist who I'd met in Hong Kong earlier in the year. But just coincidentally, the LHSA just happened to be there. Um, and they were all walking around with their cameras and their, their lanyards. I remember seeing Jim Logger walking around, uh, yep. Overgard in his Hermes, everything, you know, <laughs> <laughs> hanging out on the side. Um, so my question is: Number one, were you there? And number two, what do what do they do at those huh? meetings uh, at the headquarters? <laughs> yes, I was there in Wetzlar oh, a couple cool. of years ago. It was a lot of fun. Um, it's a really good question. What do they do? So um, the LHSA, uh, I, I want to say, it began in in sixty eight or sixty nine. Just just we just had our jubilee year, just 50th anniversary, it, it began really as a Leica-centric kind of swap meet and bullshittery. I mean, can I say that? Is that okay? No, it was yeah, like people, you know, people just want to get together and talk cameras. And, mm-hmm. and there's a lot, again, I can't stress it enough, the LHSA is a lot, it's a lot of camaraderie and it's a lot of fun. And a lot of it is sitting around and talking about how many screws are in the top plate of a 19, you know, 49 3c camera and a lot of it is talking about um our photography habits and what we do and showing photographs and sharing um and there's at the meetings a fair amount of programming um we have guest speakers we have people talking about say about photoshop or about using old like a cameras or about the difference in between different lenses or or all kinds of different topics and we we have also spring shoots, which are more or just to keep everybody involved. Again, this is all kind of pre-pandemic. Now everything is happening virtually. But we had a spring shoot, which is more uh, photography based. And then in the fall, a um, annual meeting and we would have a keynote speaker, a big fun dinner. There would be photo shoots and local photographers we would connect with and have them take us out on, you know, their favorite photo walks and all that kind of stuff and keeping everybody connected and involved and all part of the like a family, which is really, which is really what it is. And it's an awful lot of fun. Um, and there's a publication called the viewfinder, which is a pretty slick, beautiful publication that is also a mix of like our members, a mix of photographers and people who are really interested in shooting and also people who are really interested in the historica. Um, and Leica is, is kind of an interesting thing. And the LHSA embodies this, where it's a confluence of the art of photography, the science and the engineering of rangefinder cameras and Simon, other types of cameras as well. And, um, and the, and the history of these cameras of like in particular, but also just history in general. I think that a lot of people who are interested in old cameras, whether they're folding types or rangefinders or Leicas or contacts or Mamiya or whatever it is, have some kind of historian bone in their body, I think. And so it's LHSA embodies the confluence of, of this, of these three things. 
And then you also have the kind of hysteria around Leica. And I, while I'm steeped in Leica, I'm not immune to the, to understanding that there is a certain je ne sais quoi. There is a <laughs> hysteria around this brand that is, a, can be a little daunting and can be a lot of fun. Um, and it's fun. It's, it's fun to have fun with, frankly. Yeah. That, that hysteria, I think, uh, manifests itself, um, in in nothing more than the uh, the, the black paint, right? Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, it's exactly correct. And I have a number of black paint cameras myself. I'm looking at one right now. They're gorgeous. They really it used to be, and now it used to be that it used to be that if you had a black enamel or black paint camera, that incidentally I use those terms interchangeably: uh, black paint and black enamel, it's the same thing. If you had a black paint camera that had bubbling on it, like little little oxidization, collectors wouldn't go anywhere near it because it wasn't pretty enough. And now, if you have a camera that doesn't have any bubbling, people are like, oh, it's a repaint. Oh, it can't possibly be authentic. You know, so it's really interesting how the market evolves. But yeah, the, the hysteria is embodied currently, embodied by black enamel black paint cameras. Yeah. When we uh, post something on our Instagram. People go just bonkers, and I, oh, I love it. I mean, I, you know, I'm glad we we don't have a huge following, but I have a lot of fun with the Instagram uh, on the Instagrams, as I like to say. And um, when I when we post something that's black enamel, it could be anything. It could be something that's all chewed up and beaten up, or it could be something pristine. And people, everybody, just, people respond. People really love it. Yeah, the the hysteria is insane um, here in Hong Kong because a couple of years ago, before I went to Wetzler. Um, this guy named Lars Netafil, who's um, a like a dude uh, based in Wetzlar, he he came to Hong Kong for like this black paint event, which was one of oh, the yeah. most oh my surreal. god. I was moment. gonna I was gonna attend that myself, but couldn't make it. Lars is the man, super <laughs> super super nice guy, super yeah. nice guy, and he is the real aficionado, and he's the final word really around Leica. Yeah, he um th- that event was really surreal, but uh I ended up meeting him again in Wetzlar because he and the Leica archivist were were over in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. And um it, there's the, the question I wanted to ask you cuz when I was chatting with him in his shop, which is just this beautiful little place tucked away in just this picturesque village, right? Um he told me that about like 40 to 50% of his business actually came from Hong Kong. And I was oh, wondering sure. how much how much of the business you do is like local and how much of it is is international well here so i so let me make let me do my legal disclaimer <clears throat> we um i i head up two different companies and they're they're separate entities one is to mark and camera which is the company i've been talking about that my father founded um and that's a like a specialist we also sell roly and all kinds of other stuff and we have a little gallery and then there's an auction company to market auctions. And here in Illinois, they're very strict about this kind of thing. And so in the auction business, we do a tremendous amount of business in the Far East, in Singapore and in Hong Kong. Um, and with to and camera, it's a lot more local and national. We do a lot of business in Canada, some in South America, some in Europe. Um, a lot locally. God bless everyone who shops locally. I really, yeah. and I do myself too. I try yeah. as much as I as much as I can because it's really. I mean, now everybody's hungry for connection and all that kind of thing. But even especially now, it's more important than ever. Um, but anyway, for Tamark and Camera, the local camera store, um, a lot of it really is local in Europe and Canada and South America. And then the auctions company is is the Far East primarily. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you if you find yourself in Wetzlar, Germany, do yourself a favor and go to Lars Netapil's Classic Cameras. It's right around the corner from the Dom, the cathedral there, which is gorgeous and noteworthy itself. The first time I went to Wetzlar, it was not my first time in Germany, but the first time I went to Wetzlar, this is about, let's say this is maybe 10 years ago now. And I went to his store. Of course I went, it was like on a pilgrimage. Of course I went to his store and it was closed for holiday. And I 
sat down there on the cobblestone street and cried. Oh no! I, wow. was so, I, was, I mean, I cried. I, I so wanted to visit his store, and it really—it's a very small store, and he has the the most gorgeous Leica, and he's such a friendly and interesting fella. I go and visit his store. If you find yourself in that spot, the, the most incredible thing that, that happened to me when I was in his store was I had um I had on me a black uh, 3F and Ooh. I was chatting with him and he, he looked at it and he was like, you need an Araco filter for that. So he went up into his little attic um, and <laughs> yeah. just disappeared for about 15 minutes, came down with this giant box of stuff and started digging through it. And then after about 10 or 15 minutes, he was like, I'm so sorry. I don't have a black one. I was like, dude, I don't want a black Araco. That's crazy. Holy smokes. I, I See, that would be anytime any any merchant goes in back and brings out the box of stuff for me to root through, I'm happy. <laughs> I don't care if it's cameras. I don't care what it is. I, really, I just love that kind of stuff. I love going to markets. I love thrifting. I lo- I just love that kind of thing. I get it from my mom. I'll tell you that. But um, I, and it's blended well in the camera world. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it it is it is kind of amazing the stuff that he comes across and how vibrant the market is in Hong Kong in particular and also the Far East in general for cameras. It, it's really for cameras and lenses and and also there's a growing market for ephemera. So like old um, dealer signs and stands oh, yeah. and old advertisements and stuff like that people go nuts for it. oh those those big red leica signs and co- old kodak signs are just through the roof here right now everyone wants them i have one of those leica signs i bought it inadvertently i didn't really understand what it was when i got it and a guy said to me i gotta hey, show you is what is see this is the great thing about being in this business is every now and then somebody calls him and goes hey uh so I got a, I got these signs. You, you want to buy them? They, they say like on them and whatnot. <laughs> and I said, okay, sure. What do you got? And I said, will you send me a picture? He goes, ah, I'm not so good with that kind of stuff. Um, look, I'm just going to send these to you. And uh, you give me some, you give me, well, I don't know, 100, 150 bucks. I said, well, trying to get an understanding of what I was getting myself into. I said, well, <laughs> can you tell me, are they paper? Are they metal? He goes, yeah, 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 yeah it's both. I said, okay, great. I said, well, how big are they? Said, this thing is huge, man. It weighs about five or six pounds. And I said, oh, man. I said, send this to me. I tried not to get too excited. But I, sent, I said, send it to me. And he goes, well, how do you – he goes, look, I'm going to be driving through Chicago. and I'm just going to bring it to you. I'll be there. This is pre-pandemic, you know. So he said, I'm just going to bring it to you. Can you wait a week? I said, wait a week? You're calling me. This is out of nowhere. I said, you tell me when you want to come, come by. And so he brings – to me, this enamel sign from the 1920s, which is very rare and valuable, <laughs> and a paper M2 instructional sheet, which is insanely rare and valuable. Now, rare doesn't equal valuable, but and valuable doesn't really equal rare. They are indeed mutually exclusive or can be mutually exclusive. In this instance, all of the stars and planets aligned. And I got out my checkbook and I said, what do you think about $500? And he goes, oh, oh, ah, that's like drinking money for a week. Or he said <laughs> something like that. I don't know what it was. And so I wrote him a check for 500 bucks. He was absolutely overjoyed. And he goes, well, what kind of cameras do you sell? I mean, he knew it, knew it was Leica, but he said, what kind of cameras do you sell? And I started feeling really guilty. And so he goes, you know, I'm on vacation, I'm on a road trip, and I need a camera. And so I gave him a Deluxe. Oh, cool. I think it was a Deluxe 5. And I reached behind me on the shelf, and I had a, a demonstrator. And I had and I, I had a battery charging in the back, and I, I put the battery in the camera, put a memory card in the camera. And I was like, thanks for coming to visit, man. You That's made my awesome. day. He's like, oh, my God, you're giving this to me? And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, these things are really super cool and valuable. And I, I actually kind of think 500 bucks isn't enough. And he was blown away. And every time he gets anything, this guy calls. He's like, hey, uh, you remember me? I'm like, yeah, dude, I remember you. <laughs> when are you coming through Chicago with your boat, you know, boatload of goodies again? And every now and then he comes around with a box of mildew crap, and it's fine. I you know, give him 50 bucks or whatever. Very, yeah. very nice fellow. But he, he – yeah, that, so I got my own – my 
my own copy of the enamel sign, which is hard to find. But I'm nuts for that stuff. Ephemera signs, um, old uh, ads. I'm, I'm just a sucker for that stuff. I love it. And so, that's how you can tell we don't have a lot in our auction this year. You, yeah, that's how you can tell it's been a good year for finding ephemera if I don't have any in the auction because I keep it all. Wow. I'm, I'm so – I'm terrible that way. <laughs> that was actually be one of my questions for you, Dan. And I, yeah. I feel like I partly know the answer only because this ha- has happened to me at Central Camera so many times. It's like how do you overcome your own desire – for some of the things that you come across, you know, obviously it's like, you got to put food on the table. Um, but you know, there are things you come across that are just like, Holy cow. I mean, I've had so many moments like that and I'm sure you have as well, where there are things you would love to just have in your collection, you know, personally, but you, you know, you'd never be able to, you'd you'd have no inventory. Right. So, so do you, (laughs) how do you control those temptations? Is there, are you very much able to keep it in a, two different boxes, the personal interest box and the business box? Um, or or is there or is there a gray area or certain things where you just can't help yourself? I find that that gray area gets larger and larger and encroaches <laughs> in more and more in varied ways in my in my business and my personal life. No, I uh, it's very difficult. I mean, that's one of those things I think that I'm I'm always going to be uh, recovering like a nut. I'm never knocked. I'm also a tenor guitar collector and I'm, I I collect all kinds of stuff, but mainly um, in the business that I'm in, it's a very difficult thing to do. And I'm always going to be kind of a recovering uh, like a junkie. It's never going to end for me. And so there's a balance. I mean, there's a balance with my pocketbook. Certainly there's a balance with my partner. There's a balance with, with um, my, with my inventory. There's a balance with everything. And I, I have what I like to call a catch and release program. And since, since I'm fortunate <laughs> enough to have a venue to sell these items, um, I will very often take things in and put them, put them on display and enjoy them for a little while, maybe shoot a few rolls, um, and, and then put them up for sale. And actually just last week, I was looking in, in my collection and I was looking at a camera and I was like, you know what? I just don't get joy from this anymore. I've had it for a long time. Every time I put a black, black paint, camera up on the website. People go bonkers. Let me see if people are going to go bonkers for this. And lo and behold, I mean, I haven't sold it yet, but it's a catch and release program. And I, I really enjoy it. I mean, I have a really hard time with it sometimes, really, really hard time with it sometimes. There's no hard and fast rule. You know, there's, there just, there comes a time when you just have to say, I'm just, I got to buy this. Yeah, I, you just have to do it. I mean, there's a certain time you just have to do it. Like this guy that came with the signs or people that walk in with little gems, you just have to do it. And then you have to, you know, you have to have a, a kind of a, uh, a come to Jesus moment, I suppose, where you, where you say, can I really afford to keep this thing? Or not? <laughs> and that, you know, that really, that's the, where the rubber meets the road, you know, but it's, a, it's a very difficult decision, but there's things like I only collect certain Leica cameras. I'm very interested in Leica standard cameras, which were kind of cheap versions of Leicas in the uh, uh, in the 40s and 50s. They were the Leicas that didn't have rangefinders built into them, um, and were just very simplified versions. And I love that model. I also really like the M2. Um, I don't have. I really like 50 millimeter lenses. I don't care for the super duper insanely rare stuff unless it intersects with my exact interests. Um, Like one, (laughs) one day my father who is still active in the Leica world and he founded both companies, the auction company and to market and camera. And one day I remember my father came down to breakfast. I was visiting back East. He came down to breakfast and he had in his hand a very rare lens cap and he held it up to the light. <laughs> and I started to salivate. And he said, have you ever owned one of these? And I said, and I was salivating, so I could hardly really speak properly. And I said, no, how much do you want for it? And my mom kind of rolled her eyes. She was like, not at the breakfast table. And, <laughs> and, and I reached into my pocket and I had a hundred dollar bill there. And I said, I'll give you a hundred dollars for that lens cap. And I kind of couldn't, believe that I was that I was a that I was doing this and that my own flesh and blood 
father was about to fleece me. And actually, he wasn't <laughs> fleecing me. He was giving me a really good deal. And it was a really good deal. Um, and I bought it right then and there. And he, he looked at the $100 bill with some amount of suspicion. And finally, upon deciding it was genuine, put it in his pocket and nodded. And he said, you should keep that lens cap, Danny. That's a real rare find. Wow. What yeah. kind of lens cap was it? What kind, what kind of lens what cap? Kind of, oh, oh, oh. It, was a, um, it was a lens cap. It was a silver lens cap for like a Model 1. And it's a little lens cap that has a bump in it. Because the early Leica filters, there were two kinds. There were ones that clamped over the whole front of the lens, and those you could find in garage sales for 10 bucks. And then there was a tiny little thread-in filter for the 50 and 35 Elmar F3.5 yeah. lens. And you couldn't put a lens cap when you had the filter over it. And so they made this special lens cap, which had a little hump in it. And this was one of those lens caps. And they're velvet-lined. Mm. They were made in black paint and silver chrome. And this is silver chrome. It was like new. And, um, and it intersects with my collection so perfectly. I have, in fact, I did the same thing. I kid, this would give you an idea of what a nut I am. I did the same thing. I was in Germany visiting with my friends, um, there in, in, um, Frankfurt. And one of them was in the middle of buying a collection and I was watching him silently cause he was like, shut up, don't say anything. And cause he was, you know, he's making a deal. And so I was just sitting there watching this stuff go by and, in this collection was one of these lens caps and I bit my lip and finally the deal was over. We were at lunch and he had made the deal it, it consigned or bought the stuff. I don't know. I think he bought it and we had made the deal and I immediately went to lunch. We were walking to lunch and I said, what are you going to do with that lens cap? And he's like, all right, cowboy, hold on. And I, he, which lens cap? And I said, you know, which lens cap? <laughs> and he said, Oh, I didn't think you saw that. I said, I saw that. And he goes, <laughs> 200, 200, I said, I said 200. And I was being really brave because I didn't really know if I was talking dollars or euros, but I just spat it out. I said 200. And he goes 250. And again, I'm negotiating without really even understanding the currency in which I'm negotiating. And I said, uh, I hung my head. I said, oh, he's my friend. I said, okay, 250. And a moment went by and he said, euro. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. You buy lunch. And so he bought lunch and I bought one of these lens, another one of these lens caps. And it wasn't even that pretty. I hope he's listening. And it wasn't even that pretty, man. But every now and then, Johnny, every now and then it just takes over. You can't yeah, help yeah. yourself. Yeah. I, I I want one of those lens caps now. That sounds perfect. I mean – when you, you're right. When you got a filter on the Elmar, you can't put a cap on. You can't put a cap on True. it, and it's yeah. you know, yeah. And I'll, I have a real lens cap problem because we I've lost from a practice. So that's the collector story, okay? On a practical side of things, I don't use lens caps. I lose them. Yeah, same I've here. lost every lens cap that I've ever put on any camera ever. And so I I put a filter on the front of my on the front of my camera on my lens. I put the lens cap in a drawer and forget I ever owned it and. That's it. Yeah. I, I don't use them. On, on the collector side of things, as soon as I see a lens cap, I put it in a drawer. And I have mountains of lens caps. My employees think I'm nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's probably sitting there going, whoa, we're spending more time talking about lens caps than lenses. Right. At least we're staying away from rangefinders, per se. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey. I am I am making notes and uh, lens <laughs> lens cap gas is 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 going into the summary. So we have yeah. Hey, um, Dan. Speaking of uh, local uh, buyers and people coming into your shop, I want to ask you about a specific Leica. Yes. Um, that you sold recently, and I ha I have the blessing of uh, the owner to ask you about this. So, our a good friend of our show, Rob Jameson, um, has been uh, gassing for very specific types of Leicas for the last couple of months. And Ooh, I've been did he get a special camera? Oh, yeah. yes. He did. So, so I've been egging him on a little bit, but you know, he had it in my, his mind that he wanted a black paint M4. And then I, I pointed him toward you, to your website and I was like, yo, Tamarkin's got something real sweet because, you know, the M2 and the M4, they've got the, uh, the beautiful frame lines and, and that's the way to go. Yeah. He, he um, told me that he was, basically he contacted you about this M2S that you had on your website. 
And he told me that he was uh, circling your shop before you opened, just driving around the block, kind of waiting for yeah, you. Yeah, like to a open. shark. Yeah, like a shark to get it that day. <laughs> uh, but so my two questions are, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the M2R and the M2S? Uh, and then I want to ask you about this specific one because it is quite unusual. Yes. Okay. So I have to, I, I actually have getting up a little reference booklet because I don't know that I have the years exactly correct, but uh, well, I'll, I'll just leave the years out of it. So the M2 was developed as, first of all, it goes, <laughs> I hope everybody's sitting down and ready for this. The Leica M series camera, M3, was the first camera, and it was introduced in 1954. And the 3 is for three frame lines, 35, 50, 90. Or no, wait, I'm sorry, 50, 90, 135. And that's the M3. Then they came up with the M2. And then the M1. Oh, no, M3, MP, M2, M1, MD, mm-hmm. M4, M5, M6, M7. So it went, it, it's, it's in the early days, the M cameras are, it's a little backwards. But anyway, the M2 came out as a cheaper alternative to the M3, which was wildly popular. And when, when it was introduced, the M2 was also pretty popular, but it had some cheapo features on it, like a button rewind. And they moved away from that pretty quickly. And then people wanted self timers because people love selfies. And so, some later M2s have self-timers built on them. Some M2s do not. Then the U.S. Army, which was always good for spending lots of money, sometimes needlessly, had a contract with Leica to make a, the M2 camera, 2000 I think was the number, of these M2 cameras, but with kind of an idiot-proof loading device that Leica had already developed that eventually found its way to the M4. And that camera was the M2S. And the M and so that that camera has the rapid load feature where you don't have to remove the the uh, take up spool from the camera in order to properly load the film. You just in the same way that you would load at later on SLRs and other M rangefinder cameras um, you just kind of jam the film in there and put it in the, in between the tines of the take up spool and start cranking away and start shooting. And so that was kind of an idiot proof way to load a Leica. And so the U S army backed out of the contract for whatever reason, which left Leica with about 2000 of these M two S cameras. Some of them just said M two on the top plate. That's what Rob has. Mm. They're quite rare. And they are the proper M2S. And M2S is not an M2 with a self-timer. It's an M2 with this rapid load, that w- an M2 that was born with this rapid load system in it. And then, like I said, well, forget about the U.S. military. We want to sell these cameras. So have New York stamp them M2R for rapid load. And there was a little under 2,000 of them. And they were marketed here in the United States where most of them found their loving homes. And so in the far East, they're coveted because they didn't never really made the far Eastern markets. And so the M2R, the prices are all over the, all over the map, but the they're hard to find and only 2000 or less than 2000 exist. And there's a certain number of these M2S cameras. And now I'm going to turn to my reference materials to try to tell you how many were made. Because I really don't know. I want to say it was only a couple hundred. It was really not that many. And so he's got one of these special M2S cameras. The thing about his that, that seems even more interesting, though, is um, we took a look at the serial number and it fell outside the... Uh, official range of M2S serial numbers that Jim Logger had published. Yeah. And the other thing that was kind of interesting about it was it had the the old diagram for like loading with the removable spool on the bottom as opposed to the uh the like the new diagram you would find in the M M4. Uh right. So we were wondering like, hey, what is this? You know, if it's outside the serial number range, is it is it a prototype? Is it, you know, an, an after the fact mod? Because I know that that was available as a very expensive upgrade uh, at one point. Oh, it's and, a it's a mod. Yeah, if he has if his if he has that plate on the camera. See, I thought he had the M, I thought it had the M4 plate on the bottom with the rapid load 
on it. Oh, that's interesting. No, it's a mod after somebody, whoever owned that camera brought it back to Leica and said, I think I want the rapid load installed. And they did. Yeah, that makes sense. Cause it falls into a 1960 serial number range with the, um, uh, with the self timer, but that diagram when he was showing me, cause as soon as he bought it, he, he went on zoom with me and he was like, I'm going to show you every inch of that camera nice. and that diagram on the bottom. I was like, Oh, that diagram's not actually how you load it. And so we started digging, but he was like, why don't, why don't you just ask Dan? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, if that, if it doesn't have, so if it doesn't have that plate on the bottom, first of all, the plate could have been changed, but nobody yeah. would ever do that. Yeah. Um, I don't remember exactly what the serial number is. I just opened it up and looked on the underside and I was like, ooh, rapid load. That's an S camera. So, and then actually, if I remember correctly, I didn't really even notice that until I was going to hand it over to him. <laughs> I might not have. I might not even have known that in advance. I also don't remember what the serial number was. I could look it up, but I don't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, it is. A, it's a special camera because it was right in. It, it was. It was right near that range anyway of M two S. If it wasn't exactly in it. Now, so here's. So here's the thing about Leica serial numbers. Leica serial numbers are insanely accurate. However, Leica and aftermarket technicians at non Leica technicians, non factory technicians would make all kinds of different modifications to Leica cameras. And so the serial numbers really can only be a guide, Mm -hmm. but if his camera has that plate, good eye Perry, if his serial number has that plate on it, then it's almost certainly an aftermarket mod. And in order to be an M two S a proper M two S it would probably have to fall in that serial number range or within about a hundred. Cause sometimes they would take a ser- they, a camera off of serial production and say, here, outfit this with whatever the, mm. you know, whatever the new spec is for that contract and give them, give them a sample. So and just about anything is possible with a company that is manufacturing and trying to bring a dollar through the door. But yeah, if he has that diagram on the bottom, then it's a, it's a mod. That that is such a cool camera because you know to me um, the M2 is almost the perfect Leica except for two things because it's got the best frame lines in my opinion yeah um, and but apart from the uh, the manual frame counter and the the spool loading uh, those are the only two things I would change about the M2 and, and literally the M2 S M2R has one of those you know switch to the M4 M6 rapid load and so it's like right. it's pretty much the perfect camera in my in my in my mind. Yeah. Well, and you know, I've always, uh, I've never really understood why people uh, like, I love the M2 just from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, but I've never really understood about that film counter, external film counter. I'll tell you, I have owned an M M2 for like 30 years or so. I've never remembered to set that film counter when I load the film. (laughs) Never, never. But even if I had, here's the thing, I'm still going to shoot the whole roll anyway. So what does it matter? Yeah, You know, and, and I always have extra film on me, especially in the days before digital, you had to, otherwise you were carrying a six pound brick. So it, to me, it was, it was a non-starter, but I, I will pause here to tell you my, my take up school story and why I dislike the M2, M3 system. I was standing on a hill. I was in um, Arizona and I'd been on a little hike up a hill to watch the sunset and I had my M2 with me <clears throat> and I was standing on the top of the, this little hill watching the sunset and I used my last, my last frame. And so I rewound it, which is always a little bit of a pain, but you know, it slowed me down and I was enjoying the sunset there and I had put the base plate in my pocket, tapped out the film, put that in another pocket, took out the spool, bobbled it, and oh. it fell down oh. about five, four, five hundred vertical feet. And I watched it go ping, 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 ping. Oh, ping, no. Walked there in the distance down into this gully. And I was like, oh, shit. Well, that's it for that. So I don't – I always also carry an extra spool with my M2. <laughs> um, and that – but at least it was the last day of my vacation. So it could have been worse. It could have been worse. I only I only missed a few, a few shots, I suppose. But that was a really – that was a sad – sad moment for me and my M2. Um, and so that, that really is a caveat, I think, of that, of the camera system. But once you get used to taking out the spool, not dropping it and loading the camera, it goes pretty quickly. Yeah, it's not too bad. Just the quick load is a, is a convenience. Oh, absolutely. 
So, so Dan, one of the uh, ongoing tropes of this podcast, as you'll know, is um, Simon often complains that Johnny and I spend too much time talking about like a thread mount uh, rangefinder lenses. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're here to set him straight on that. But, uh, but I want to ask you: um, Do you have any favorites as far as thread mount lenses go, both Leica and non Leica? I am increasingly fascinated by how many non Leica screw mount lenses when just weird, weird yeah. lenses are out there. And a lot of them I think are, are interesting in part because of, of how of their, uh, let's call it their signature. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes lenses have a signature and sometimes lenses just aren't very good. Um, and I'll tell you, I came across something called a 55 millimeter luminar. Oh, yeah. sounds, it sounds quite enticing. F1.8. You guys, have you ever heard about this lens? Yeah. Yeah, you have? I'd love to learn. Thread, thread, thread mount lenses are, that, that's the thing that I collect. Like non like a thread mount lens, I'm obsessed with them. But I've, never, see, seen, I've never seen one of those before in real life. It's fascinating. I never heard of this lens. A 55 millimeter F1.8 luminar. And I don't know, luminar just sounds enticing. So, <laughs> um, I, I haven't used it yet. I'll give you, I'll, I'll let you know when I do, I'm, I'll test it out. I, you know, besides some quirky like lenses that were made in screw mount, I think that my favorite all time lens has got to be the 50 Sumicron in like a screw mount. I mean, it's the one I still go to. They made this lens also an M mount and they're very common in either. So yeah. it's kind of a cheat. I guess my question, my answer is a little bit of a cheat, but um, that's got to be my favorite, like go to screw mount lens. But I use the 35 Elmar F3.5 a lot, a lot, because it's like a little, it's a point and shoot. You set it at F8 and, you know, a, a, sun, a, a kind of sunny, sunny F8 rule, if you will. And it just go to town. I I, I love yeah. that little lens, and it's it really it's fantastically sharp for what it is. Uh, it has a beautiful bokeh, and again for what it is, and the early uncoated pre-war lenses I think are the most interesting of all. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. I mean the 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 luminar that you mentioned. Um, I, I've never seen one of those in real life, but I know there's a collector here in Hong Kong who has one. Is it rangefinder coupled? Yes. Does it say? Does it just say Luminar on the front plate, or does it say like Royal Frankfurt and and kind of everything? I've, I've no, it's not the Royal Frankfurt one. I've oh, seen God. those. No, I've seen those, and I I what is it? I actually think I have one in my collection, but the um this I don't know what this lens is. I honestly I don't. <clears throat> Pardon me. I know that it is. I know that it's fifty five. I know it's a luminar. I know it's f one point eight. I know uh-huh. that it's not been tampered with. I can I can look at the the screws and I can see that it's originally manufactured in um in in like a thread mount, like a screw mount M thirty nine. And I can see that it hasn't been tampered with. I can see that it hasn't been particularly well treated throughout its life. Um, but other than that, I really don't know a lot about it. So I'm still researching this lens. You'll, you'll You'll find it in our rare camera auction in November. Little shameless plug. Um, Saturday, November fourteenth, we're going to auction. All, all, I think it's three hundred and ninety-five lots of Photographica, some of which has never been seen before. So it'd be super interesting to, to see what happens with this. But the Luminar will be on the auction block. It's a scuggly lens. I got to tell you, it's not very pretty. Um, it really has been 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 ridden hard and put up wet. But it, I mean, I'm really interested to shoot it. I mean, it's the optics look good. Um, it's got lots of bubbles, very little dust. Looks like a funky, a funky old lens. I love stuff like that. I just found a. I just I brought this for show and tell, and then I realized it's a podcast, so um, you can't Sorry, see we it. Sorry, we all the time. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, but it, this is a Hugo Meyer uh, Gorlitz and New York. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And New York. What? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Aquino Plasmat. Oh, man. Yeah, this is a really, really cool lens. Wait, wait, Kino, what? Yeah, Aquino Plasmat. I have a picture of it on my Instagram. On my, it's, I think it's on my personal Instagram, and it's on Tamarkin. It's on – wait, what's my Instagram handle? Tamarkin Chicago. And 
Okay, so it's a Kinoplasma F1.5, and it says focal, like FOC, focal three inch, whatever that means. So it's probably like a 75 millimeter patent, Dr. Rudolph, Hugo, Meyer, and company, Gorlitz, and New York. And it's got its original lens shade. It weighs a ton. It's F1.5. It's soft and silky and beautiful, uncoated, with the original lens cap. I've never seen anything like this. I've seen plasmats, uh-huh. but I've never seen the Kino plasmat. And I've seen I, I mean, there's certain aspects of this lens. So anyway, it's super cool. It's really weird lens, but I'm super stoked to shoot it. And it's a it's a lot like a fan bar, like any one of these soft lenses from pre-war, where they kind of had the center of the lens down tight. F8, it looks terrific. Wide open, it just it's anybody's guess, you know. And it's like a it's like a screw mount. The, the Kino plasmats are pretty popular here, but I've never seen one that looks like this, uh, let alone one that says New York on it. That's that's crazy. I've never seen it before. I've never seen it before. It's a gra- basically a garage find, garage sale find. Yeah, um, that that yeah. is um, that, that is such a cool rabbit hole to go down. Cool. Once, once you kind of realize that there were all of these, you know, random. Well, I mean, like Hugo Meyer is not a random brand, but just so many manufacturers making. Uh, lenses for screw mount. I mean, there must have been that must have been primarily economically driven, I assume. Oh yeah, it was a very popular mount. Um, people who had Leicas had money, typically to buy other stuff. And certainly, beginning in the 1940s and post-war, there was no end to the stuff that you could buy for your camera, for any kind of camera, for for every kind of camera. There was there were flashes and brackets and filters and cables and all kinds of viewers and VisoFlex units and all kinds of just bonkers stuff. And it was the heyday of camera stores and salesmen and women um, who would, could sell anything and did. And there was no end to the stuff that you could buy. And there's some camera stores still have a vestige of, that kind of flavor and central camera is one of them. Hmm. And it's magical walking in to like, I really love old hardware stores. Me personally, I just love hardware stores. Um, And some camera store and camera stores used to have that je ne sais quoi of like, just say there was everything there. And there was a smell that was a little bit like road and all, you know, there was like (laughs) a little, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I do. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. I love it. I had that smell for sure. Yeah, it's old. It's 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 like old grease, old camera grease, um, and and chemistry, and you know a few different things, other things, and a little bit of mustiness. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I smell cameras before I buy them. I'll oh, take yeah. off the base plate and smell them, and people laugh at me. They're like, oh, oh, "Look at you, camera sniffer." I'm, you know. I, you got to. It's part of the whole inspection process. It is, yeah. You can. It's. It, I. I know exactly what you mean, Dan, because you can tell about how things were stored and maybe what's going on on the inside, and it's very interesting. The the nuances of things that you get when you when you you know go run into something old like that. Now I don't. I, yeah, absolutely. Now I don't peer through lenses with a light unless I have unless I suspect that I'm going to see something. Mm. I have a love hate relationship with that. Mm. Um, but I will tell you that I do look through a lens before I buy it or before yeah. I use it. And I once looked through a 280 millimeter reflex lens and <laughs> saw a healthy um, population of um, mosquitoes living there, <laughs> nested there. And so I, I, you know, I took a pass on that one. You never know what you're what you're going to find. Yeah. <laughs> I found all kinds of stuff inside cameras. Uh, one time, one time I got, there was a, a guy who buys at my auction and sometimes buys from me, from, from the store, but buys at the auction and he likes to pay in strange ways. One of them is to trade and he always has stuff that nobody wants to trade. And like he, he'll come and say, I've got four mildewed Polaroids. What will you give me? <laughs> but he, one time he said, I'm sending you an old camera. And I said, oh, cool. Thanks, man. I mean, I didn't know what he was sending. We were in the middle of this trade. And so he sent me this camera. This, and it was an old camera. It was like, you know, late 1800s. And 
And he said, did you get the camera? And I said, yeah. And I put it like, I left it on the shipping table. It's just sitting there. I just left it there sitting on the shipping table. Cause I was like, Oh, what is this? It's like a piece of junk. And he goes, did you open it? I was like, well, I didn't open it. It's just an old camera. He goes, open it. And you put five grand in the, in the camera. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and so I had no idea. I mean, I didn't know there was cash in the camera. And he was like, hey, did, you get the, did you get the camera? Did you get the camera? Did you get the camera? And so I opened the camera. I took the money out. And I put the camera on my shelf. And now you can come and visit the camera that had all the cash in it. I almost threw the thing out. <laughs> I didn't know why he sent it to me. I, thought, I didn't know if it was part, part of what, some kind of crummy thing he wanted to trade me. But for once, he got off his duff and paid in cash. God bless him. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you got to open everything up. You got to look inside everything. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Dan, while, um, while we got you here, can I, can I ask you about a couple of uh, lesser steam or uh, sort of rare things that I've stumbled across here in Hong Kong? I just have no idea what it is. Yeah, sure. Sure. All right. Um, so one of the things I've seen recently here is uh, a lens. Um, it's a 58 millimeter f 1.5 lens in in Leica screw mount, and it says Leica hyphen sonar on the front. Uh, it's sold at Breguet Camera, uh, and they have it listed as a, a prototype. Um, where the shopkeeper was telling me that basically, you know, Leica was messing around with the sonar design. But have you? Do you have any idea what that might be or, or what the kind of lineage of that might be? Yeah, I've heard of these lenses before. I've I've never seen one. I've never held one in my hands. But I do know that there was a lot of collaboration between Zeiss and Leica, especially in the pre-war um, era. <clears throat> and, and earlier, indeed, they were all working. The optical works, you know, they would – sometimes they would call or they would talk with one another. And in as much as the activity didn't interfere with patents – um, or, 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 you know, trade secrets. I, I do get the impression that Zeiss would call Leica, not in any official capacity necessarily, but, you know, Sam would call Mikey and say, Hey, Mikey, at, you know, ask Ray at the next table, if he has what a retaining ring for a 49 millimeter front element for, a you know, whatever kind of lens. He's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'll send it over to you. And I do think that there was a tremendous amount of collaboration. So it wouldn't surprise me to learn that in a, just in a, in a people collaborating, interested engineers collaborating, like in the way scientists do, that there would be some cross pollination there. Um, That exact object as a, now I want to go and look at it. I want to see it. There's look, there's enough value in especially prototypes that, it's perilous in, you know, when, when a, when a rare, look, when, when a Rolex Daytona can sell for a hundred thousand dollars, all of a sudden it becomes worth forging yeah. Spend twenty $25,000 to forge the thing right now. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to forge a Leica M2S that sells, you know, for a couple grand, nobody's going to forge something like that because it's just, it doesn't make any sense. But when you start talking about some of these lenses that, prototypes and one-offs that are exceedingly rare if somebody's really going to pay that kind of money then it becomes worth forging you know so there's a balance to be struck there i think from a just in a in a uh, in a supply and demand kind of kind of sense you know just in a fiscal kind of sense so you really got to look at those lenses and look at whether or not they've been tampered with and what kind of optics they have and uh, i'd be super interested to see anything that's branded like that i think it's kind of uncommon that it would say like a sonar mm-hmm. i think that it would say something like um you know i i think that because a sonar was a brand of a lens not the company manufacturer. So I would think it would be a sonar sumar or a, or yeah. a sonarit or something weird like that, you know? But who yeah. knows? You got to look real closely at stuff like that because a good machinist and a good enameler or, you know, a good, they could do great stuff. I mean, there are very famous forgeries that one can find out and about these days, quite prominently featured. Out in the marketplace, easy yeah. to find, easy to find. Yeah, you can always prove that. So, or l- let me put it this way: you can always potentially prove that something is a fake. It's almost impossible to prove that something is real. 
Mm. You know, because then you have to have what the guy that made it standing there. Then no, there those people aren't still alive. You have to have this. You, in order to really prove that something is of genuine provenance and 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 authentic, it really has to be authenticated in a number of different ways. And it's much mm. easier to prove a fake than it is mm-hmm. that something's real. But well, what you were saying earlier was super interesting too, because you know we we hear a lot obviously about the collaboration between Leica and Schneider. With like the the Xenon and the Sumeret and the Super Angulons, mm-hmm. um, but not so much about collaboration between Leica and Zeiss. Um, and you know the I, I I don't know about you guys, Johnny and Simon, um, but I I haven't actually read or seen that much on the relationship between them in terms of working together from an engineering point of view. Other than you know the the Elmar is basically a Tessar, right. Right. I mean, they, they competed so closely and, and also worked at the same, you know, on the same kinds of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dan, I got, I got two more rare items I want to ask you about. Yeah. Well, uh, let me, and yes, Perry, thank you. I, I also just want to say real quick, I don't mean to imply that this like a sonar 50, it's, you said 51.5? 58. 58 1.5. Well, that's interesting. I'm going to look this up. I don't mean to imply that it's not genuine. I just think it's kind of weird that, yeah, it, yeah. Say, uh, that it doesn't say like a Zeiss. Right, or, right. Or Zeissica or, or <laughs> I know something. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? I, I sent a picture of it in, in our chat, but I mean, when I saw this in the oh, shop, cool. I'm like, what the hell is this? Um, and, and that's what they told me. Yeah, so the, um, the, the another really weird thing I saw here. And, and this was in a shop where, you know, almost every dealer in Hong Kong has the stuff that's for sale. And then they have this shelf full of really sweet stuff, which is the that's mine. You can't have it uh, shelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and and this is um I think it was a Leica 3G, but it has a 50 Sumicron on it and a leaf shutter. And a what? Ooh. A leaf shutter. And so there is, there is a... Um, uh, like a separate shutter button on the front of the camera, sort of where you might find a shutter button on like um like on an alpha or sure. or or an ex- or some exactas, but but on the right hand side. But yeah, it's it's a three G, and it's got a Sumicron, but the Sumicron has a leaf shutter in it. And a, oh yeah, what is that? That's the Compor fifty fifty Compor Sumicron. That is very rare. The, so, first of all, the lens that, if I'm identifying it correctly, that Compor Sumicron, it was silver chrome, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Both camera and lens. Yeah. The, and, and most 3Gs are, are, are silver. There, there are some that were made in, in black finish. Leica made a Compor Sumicron, and it's basically a 50 Sumicron that has a, a, a shutter built in, and they're super rare. I don't remember exactly how many were made. Um, I'm actually looking it up now to see because I'd like to be able to give you and your listeners an, an actual and the world an actual figure as best I'm able. But I don't have it at my fingertips. Um, but yes, they did. They made the Compor Sumicron, and then there was also subsequently made a release arm, a linkage arm that would link the Sumicron to the camera. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head if that linkage arm is actually a Leica product or not. I think it might have been aftermarket. It's pretty rare. I can't remember the last time I saw one or held one. I, I did see one at the Leica auction, the Lights Vetslar auction. Um, uh, during the 1950s, Lights Vetslar produced the most unusual variation of this lens, which incorporates the Compor shutter, speeds 100 and 200. The purpose of the lens was to provide electronic flash synchronization at these two speeds. Oh, the that makes sense. The shutter release was by a flat trigger mechanism. I found it, incidentally. Um, <laughs> the Compor yeah. shutter could be set up on open, as set at open, and the camera shutter used in the conventional way. So you could also just use it as like a regular lens, too. Wow. So that crazy linkage arm, like I, I do know that that linkage arm is makes the Compor Sumicron much more valuable, but I can't can't recall if it's actually a Leica product. It might have been an aftermarket product. Yeah, because what if it, it holds the yeah. shutter open, right? It holds the actual totally. the shutter open? Totally. Yeah. That's what it does. And so if you see one of those, you know, for some kind of stupid price, that's a good example of something that does not sell for enough money that it makes sense for some machinist to make one. 
So if you see one of those, it's almost certainly genuine. And I don't remember what they sell for, but certainly a few thousand dollars. I mean, that would be, that would probably be on my not for sale shelf. So one, <laughs> of, one of the first things that I teach people when they come to work with me is what NFS means. <laughs> yeah. Right. I just, I just looked on uh, eBay and uh, currently 5% of the, of the uh, Compor Sumicrons are currently on eBay at this moment. There's three of them on there. And according to one of the adverts on there, uh, yeah. 50, 58 of them were made. Uh, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah they're very few. And uh, the prices, they were all uh, around the world, but I'll, I'll give the price in, in pounds, so you have to do the maths. Um, and they range between just over £6,000 up to close to £7,100. Uh, those those seem to be pretty. Those are pretty appropriate prices, especially if it has that crazy little arm with it. Yeah, they look great. And, and if the lens hasn't been tampered with, if it if it if it's clean and clear. Also, the optics on that lens have very often show that beautiful orangey cast that the lanthanum and thorium mm. rare earth optics from the nice. early nineteen fifties do. And it's just super sexy mm -hmm. optics. Really beautiful stuff. Um, Dan, I mean, you, you managed to answer my follow-up question, which was why did they make that for flash sync? But what, 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 um, what like encyclopedic Bible were you, uh, just leaping through there to? Oh, so I have a Hove publication. Um, uh, oh. it's a Hove book that has all the serial numbers and they yeah. list like a little bio on each lens. Yep. Um, and it, and so, and there, so there are a number of different. There are a number of different things that we use, and I'm not, I, I don't give away any trade secrets necessarily, but I will tell you that we have serial number lists are, are pretty um, available and pretty accurate. Um, you know, you got to remember that very often the manufacturers just wanted to bring a dollar through the door. So the serial number lists are not, um, you know, the, the word the absolute last and final word. And things did get varied from a little bit for experimental and for one-off kinds of reasons. But um, uh, we have access to delivery records and to other resources that will tell us, for, for example, very early like is exactly what the camera was born as so that we don't necessarily have to open up a rare camera. Right, right. Okay, last, last one. Um, this this is a lens that I just have the most irrational gas for because it has such an unusual lens design and, and sort of um, signature. What can you tell me about the Elcan 50 millimeter f2 that came on the KE7A? Ooh, that's a cool lens. Yeah, it's um, so cool. It's so tiny. Yeah, that's also a rare Earth lens. That's a lanthanum lens. It has um, – it, so in other words, these lenses, the LAK9 lenses as they're known in Leica land, they'll get a tick off the Geiger counter, which is always always kind of impresses people um, or scares them away, one of, one of the two. Um, the, the, that LKN lens, it's a very small lens with an oddball ta uh, tab. Um, but first of all, any, any of this stuff that I'm talking about – most of the stuff that I'm talking about, we have and can offer photographs – and details of, I happen to have one of these Elkan lenses in the next room in my collection. And, and we're happy to do so. So we encourage you and your listeners to contact us, if you wish, for information. We're all, we're all about it. Um, and for photographs. Sometimes people just like to see pictures. What's interesting about this lens is it was made in a very different way. It was made also for a U.S. Army contract, and it has special gaskets in it that help to cushion the optics against the concussion from an explosion. Whoa. And so, yeah. Wow. So they're actually made to be somewhat explosion resistant. And they use that, that lanthanum glass. And it, it's basically, it's a 50 Sumicron made in Canada. Um, they very often are found to have some funky separation. It's a very easy lens to surface, uh, to service, which leads uh -huh some people to open them and monkey about. And so you can find a lot, a lot of these lenses with inner surface distress on the optics because people decided to clean it themselves. Um, but it's a, it's basically a 50 Sumicron. I think from its, from its optics, 
optical performance, I'll say. I've never noticed anything different. Because, well, but they're four element lenses, unlike the six element uh, Summicron. Yes. And so that's what's always fascinated about, uh, fascinated me about the lens. You know, the, the fact that it's got that level of performance on a four element. It's definitely not a Tessar and, and it thereby making it compact. But if it's built to withstand like bomb blasts, it makes sense that fewer elements is more desirable too. I think that's, I think that it was all kind of the, a, a perfect storm, if you will, of these different things that came together to make that lens. And the camera is also weather sealed against heat and, um, and the top plate has special gaskets in it as well. The KE seven eights and Leica M four KE seven a. And there's two of them. There's a military camera of which about 200 were made. And then there's a civilian model of which only, I think, 55 were made. And they all have those features. And then there were more of the lenses. It wasn't a one-to-one thing. There were more of the lenses made, I think. But they're, they're very difficult to find. That's, that's in my NFS cabinet. I have one. I'm not even an M4 nut, but I found one of those – and and I squirreled it away. And I, I like to show that off. That's a super cool Leica camera. Army Leica camera. Really cool. Yeah, that's, that thing is awesome. I had one. I had one for a little while that had a lens that somebody cleaned with a Brillo pad. And it, oh. it, yeah, it was awful, man. It was so sad. So sad. I sold it to a fella in Ohio. Um, and he was just so jazzed up for that lens. I was like, you know, I showed him the lens. I was like, dude, you got to look through this lens because it's a, it's a mess. And he's kids. I don't care. Can it be fixed? Can it be fixed? I was like, look, do you think that could be fixed? Like really, man? I mean, it looks like it got clean with a Brillo pad. Use your, you know, sometimes you just have to use the base basic visual inspection. And I said, you know, use your own, use your own peepers and tell me what you think. And he was so hot for the lens that he bought it anyway. And, but I had taken some photographs with it because it was really, messed up and i wanted to see what it would do at f2 and the answer is nothing (laughs) it was fine at f2 it was fine you have to hit a lens with a hammer to make it misbehave yeah and then and really i mean really because at these wide apertures i find that the the light is careening around to such an extent that it really doesn't matter i mean i've seen Lenses with all sorts of deleterious horror shows happening inside of them. And when you use them wide open, they're really terrific and silky and beautiful. And then when you stop them down to F8, then you start to see the horrors of what's really inside the lens. You know? hey, um, Dan, one, one thing that I've noticed lately, um, although this doesn't seem to be the case looking at your website, is there a global shortage of like a MPs right now? Yes. Why? I want one. <laughs> Cause you used to be able to buy them new and, and, I've just noticed they've disappeared from shelves. Although you seem to have a new one. On There's, I do. I, we have a, we have an MP. It's not new, but it's like new. It's mint condition, which mint for us is not an ice cream flavor. It's actually means without any mark on it at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do. We have a, I have a couple of MPs for sale. Our website does not necessarily tell you exactly what we have because we have wish lists and we have, folks who have been waiting for things. And so they don't necessarily appear on our website, but we have a black enamel MP and a 0.85 range finder, which is not made anymore. We have the a silver one, but yeah. So the, the MP global shortage, there's a couple of reasons. One is that they just got real popular all of a sudden. And yeah. I don't know if it was because, you know, the M six got a resurgence because Somebody somewhere saw Kim Kardashian with one, and all oh, no of a sudden, yeah, yeah. And so, I, I, one of my customers told me where, but I wouldn't know Kim Kardashian if she came up and slapped me across the face. So I didn't really even know where to look. But anyhow, apparently that was a big thing. And maybe someone saw Brad Pitt or somebody else with an M6, and oh, I gotta have an M6, I gotta have an M6. <laughs> and so the same thing may have happened with the MP. Um, But also, you know, like uh, like other European companies, they make things in batches. And so it's not like they have the Leica MP line, which is, you know, constantly full of of merry little elves cranking out MP cameras. No, it's a very serious undertaking for which they tool and retool. And so they make 500 MPs or I, I don't know what the number is, but they make a certain amount of MP cameras and off they go around the world to dealers 
and to Leica stores and they get snapped up and then there's no more to be had for six months. And then when you have something like this crazy pandemic interfering with everything, you know, then supply chains really get screwed up all around the world. But it's a combination of the way that Leica and other European manufacturers make things and just the sheer demand and popularity. It's also the only camera currently manufactured in black enamel. And the only Leica M camera that's manufactured in black enamel. And now I'm racking my brain to see if I'm right about this. I don't think anything. Yeah. Cause I, I know that, you know, the potential is that Leica people will come to me. Hey, oh, you got that wrong. You got that wrong. You got that wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I opposed, get stuff wrong all the time. Right. As opposed to black chrome, because most everything is black chrome now, right? Yeah, because it wears better. Yeah. It well, wears better, yeah. It wears better, but doesn't look the same when it wears, right? I mean, I don't right. know. Yeah. Right, right. I think so that's exactly it's right. Way nicer as it wears. Yeah. <laughs> what, the paint? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, because it's brass underneath. So you yeah. get that beautiful, beautiful gold brassed up patina. It's really, uh, uh, yeah, it's spectacular. I mean, some some years ago there was a, a Leica special edition, a new camera. Uh, it was, a, I think, the Lenny Kravitz Reporter edition or something yeah. like that, yeah. and it was like pre pre brassed up. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would tell my customers, well. Oh, don't buy that thing. I mean, I, you just buy a camera for me and I'll brass it up for you. <laughs> <laughs> Save 20 grand. So, yeah, this is a good intro to perhaps the, uh, the most controversial topic in camera, camera dumb or one of them, which is, and we might as well go ahead and hit it because I know you, you enjoy this topic and I think we <laughs> enjoy it as well. Um, but I think we should talk about the like ethos a little bit just to push everyone listening to this podcast. Who's not, you know, fully over the edge. Now we're, let's just go fully over the edge into like them. Um, and, and they're, they're, you know, like it's one of those brands, it's a luxury brand unapologetic, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, aspirational brand, all product line, all product categories have aspirational brands, whether it's cars, whether it's watches, whatever. And like, is that aspirational brand, in in cameras and, yeah. and and every industry needs a brand like that right because it's it's a leader it, it 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 you know it drives kind of everybody towards a certain direction that is helpful for out for everyone involved in that, right. in that industry so there's certainly the like ethos um and i i think it would be great to to hear your take on what makes a like a special um and you know, also a little bit thinking about when when Leicas first came out. I mean, they were you know they're very much considered sort of user tools, right? They weren't necessarily these luxury items, but at some point there was this transition that happened where they became those luxury items. And I would love to hear your take on um, a little bit on the Leica, the ethos and the mystique, and and do you have a feeling about? Um, where in terms of like as history, they kind of became a, a, aware of their own mystique and began really playing up into that themselves. Ooh, that's a really interesting question. That's a really interesting question. I, um, okay. I'm going to tell you what, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I think. And, and I'm, I'm going to be absolutely frank with you there. First of all, I'm a Leica collector and a Leica nut and a Leica file um, as well as a Leica salesman. And so it's both my bread and butter and it's also a real passion for me. And I, I can't stress it enough to say that we are all batshit crazy <laughs> in one way or another. And everybody is, you know, everybody is. So like, you know, I don't remember where I heard this, but I, somebody was saying something about you and anybody could be a nerd for anything, you know, like I'm a camera nerd. Like I have friends who are watch nerds or fountain pen nerds or so like, I'm super stoked about Leica. I love Leica, uh, but I also just like cameras yeah. So even though I happen to to have this brand for which I'm both grateful and 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 super fortunate, um, and it's a delicate, living, breathing thing. It's like a child, you know. You have to take care of it. Super lucky to have it. But I also have this fever. I'm looking right now 
I'm in my living room looking at folding cameras that I'm fortunate to own, a couple of Leicas. There's something called a Futura, which looks like it has a can of – it's made like a can of tuna. Yeah. I mean there's something that like I love it all. Okay. So having said that, us like a people are berserk and we're all berserk about – one thing or another. And sometimes it's the history. Sometimes it's the bling. Sometimes it's the boca. So I want to give a shout out to everybody who's into something. God bless you. Shop locally. I love it. There's nothing like a Leica. When you put it in your hands, and I'm talking now about Leica screw mount cameras, barn axe as they're called, and Leica M cameras. But it's really true of all of them, all of the Leica cameras. That nothing feels like a Leica. Nothing feels like a Leica. Okay. Leica is about three things. Now I'm going to tow the company line for a second. Okay, Leica is about three things. But I really mean it. I really believe this too. Leica is about precision, German precision engineering. It's about the finest optics in the world. And I'll go to the mats with anybody about this. Mainly as, as a layperson, because I don't know anything about optics. Um. And about the emotion and the feel of it. Leica is about the engineering, the optics, and the sheer emotion and feel of it. And the reason I'll go to the mats about optics with anybody is because I don't really know what I'm talking about. I should <laughs> – I have – you know you know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't have a degree in optics. I've shot – I'm super fortunate in that I get to shoot with all, all this really interesting – and otherwise, for most mere mortals, untouchably expensive and rare gear. Mm. And so I have a knowledge base that maybe some other folks don't have just from a breadth of experience. But it, when it comes to like, you know, how many elements are in a lens or like what it all really does, <laughs> I really don't know what I'm talking about. So I, I – but I really like Leica. I like the way they feel and I like the images that they produce. The fact of the matter is I love cameras and I love photography. You can hand me a hot tank Fisher Price camera with a lens that's made from the bottom of a Coca-Cola bottle and I'm fine with it. I'll shoot, I'll shoot until the film runs out. And so I have both in my veins. I have that just Leica craziness. And I have the real shooter love of photography and cameras, which yeah. is what I suppose makes my brand kind of successful, if I do say so myself. Yeah. Because you can come into my store and I'll stand on a Leica camera to show you how strong they are. And you'll find that while Leica is befitting all of the luxury and fanciness that salesmen and women and people can bring to it, You'll find me in jeans and a and a um, and a t-shirt probably, or jeans and an untucked shirt, wearing comfortable shoes in a very familiar and welcoming environment. And I will not have any of that stodgy, pretentious BS in my store. <laughs> I won't have it. I'll I'll welcome you and put a Leica in your hands. These days, we have to ask if you have an appointment, just because that's just the way things are right now. Yeah. But uh, we're all about putting the gear into people's hands and buying your first Leica or shopping for a Leica. As I intimated before, it should be an exciting experience. It should be fun. It should be like going into a hard, the hardware store and breathing in that hardware store smell or the camera store smell and looking at something that is for the moment, not affordable or untouchable and being able to explore. And, and, and it's really what it's all about. The family and the camaraderie of the things. And so I, one day will write a book, a taxonomy of like a nuts, and, you know, because you have the, you know, it's like, it, you know, I'll have to come up with some kind of binomial nomenclature for them. That'll be like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. But you can read about it first here. I'm going to write the book and it's going to because there's all there's all kinds of crazy like it people. I mean, I've got people that carry ten thousand dollar cameras in a in a towel, ratty old towel in a backpack. And I've got people that come in and spend. God bless them. Seven hundred and fifty dollars on a camera bag for for a thousand dollar camera for a fifty dollar camera. Like you just never know. We're all nerds for something. We're all crazy for something. And I just want everybody to fly that freak flag 
and buy whatever they want to buy. And just because, you know, people say to me, oh, you must hate iPhones. No, I use my iPhone all the time. It's my color camera. And just because people have a love of photography doesn't lead them to my brand, to this brand yeah. and to my store and to this luxury brand of Leica. Um, but I, I sure want their experience to be one of welcoming when they do discover the red dot and when they do get that fever, because it is a fever. Yeah. It is a fever. And and God bless them. I mean, I've got people that come in and, you know, that have the really expensive gear wrapped up in a towel. And I've got people that come in that have never taken a photograph in their life, God bless them. But they, they just got to have an Octolux. Everybody's, everybody's a nerd for something. Uh, that that's awesome too because you know the first time the first time you you hold a Leica I remember when I got my first Leica it was an M6 just holding it trying it looking through the viewfinder more than anything else it was like I get it I totally yeah. get it but some people but, yeah no go on I was gonna say some people really like it some people get in front of the rangefinder and they're like aha and then. Simon, I got it. I got to say, I know it, man. That some people get the rangefinder in their hands. They're like, "Oh, come on, I know. Let me see what the lens sees. Give me the picture." I get I, it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we 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 talked before we came came on air that uh, I have an M two, and I I I love it. I think it's an absolutely beautiful object, and I and I get exactly what you're saying about you know how how they feel, the weight of them, the the quality of the construction and and also when I when I I'd, because I've, I've had three Leicas I started off with a with a 3C uh, which came with a collapsible Summicron which I still have because it's amazing um, and uh, then I had a, a G thinking I needed a bigger viewfinder and I still didn't like didn't like it at all the Barnack style mm-hmm. and then uh, I picked up a, an M2 and I really, really liked what I was seeing, you know, just like Perry was just saying, just like looking through the viewfinder, you know, forget, forgetting about the rangefinder element, just just looking through the viewfinder was just special. I was like, I'm, I'm just looking through glass, but why is it different? You know, so there was, there was, there was definitely some, something going on there. Um, but for me personally, yeah, it, it's a case of, from a, from a using perspective, um, I, I just, just, I've never really gelled uh, with, with, with that rangefinder. It's a really beautiful camera. You sent me – it sent us a, on our little uh, group uh, prep, preparation text here. It's a beautiful camera with a screw mount, collapsible Summicron, which is my favorite lens. This is my favorite rig. It's absolutely beautiful. And I, I – you know, I – at first, it took me a little while to get used to that range finder. But then I started with a Pentax K1000 or Spotmatic. I don't remember exactly what the model was. But um, – and I love that camera. And I thought the the – Lens was good. I mean, what did I know? I was a kid. I didn't really know anything. But it really bothered me that when the mirror went up, I didn't see the photograph. And that that just always kind of struck me as a thing. I was like, why do people put up with that? And then I got my hands on a Leica. And let me tell you that the house I grew up in, there were Leicas everywhere. But I wasn't allowed to go anywhere near them because <laughs> they were, you know, this is this is my, my father's business that he started in, in the house that I grew up in. Um, and so I remember hearing words like Sumacron and Elmar when I was growing up the same way, you know, lots of kids hear, you know, baseball terminology, you know, or, or, or soccer terminology, football terminology, whatever. So I was very much steeped in it, but I did not have a silver spoon. I had a Pentax K1000 and I did when I first got my dad to lend me a Leica for a weekend I I just I fell in love with it. I just thought it was the the neatest thing. I thought it was so heavy. I, it was stupid, yeah. but um, uh, boy, I just fell in love with it. Some people do. Some people just fall in love with them. Um, just just as a as moving to one side a little bit. I mean that photo. <clears throat> I just remembered the the photograph I took of that that lens. Uh, sorry, that that camera and the lens. Um, it's it, it's got a, an unusual look uh, around it and the reason why it looks slightly unusual is because it's a it's a three uh it's a three photo stack uh, so it's a focus stack um, huh. and um and i uh, that's how i got the outer focus area to be exactly in the right place and it, and it disappears slightly unnaturally um but interesting enough i took that shot with a seven artisans uh 50 millimeter 1.1 on a mm-hmm. on a sony and I'm, I'm curious um what what you know is a is a leica 
um, dealer and like a man. What what your viewpoint is on on some of these you know these Chinese super fast lenses that are out there? At, at incredibly good prices. I think they're fantastic lenses, and they're and the price is great. They have a great feel to them. I think that the look the technology is out there. I. While I while I would be remiss to say anything other than there's nothing like a like a lens, I don't know the human eyes really can tell the difference. I, I really don't. Now I was an English major, not a, a, a not an optician or or a scientist, and so I really can only speak from my own kind of experience. And I'm a little bit spoiled in that I do the preponderance of the lenses that I typically use are like a lenses. And so I admit to being a little bit spoiled, certainly from a construction and a research and development standpoint, the Leica is always going to win the day. Yeah. It's just the best. And, and not, not that there aren't others that are X that are, that are equally as good. And I think the seven artisans in some of these lenses are contenders. They're fantastic. And they're designed for, digital photography they're designed for a beautiful bokeh not critical sharpness and i think that um achieving critical sharpness in an image is now it's de rigueur you can anybody Mm. can build a lens that will give you critical sharpness whereas in the 40s and 50s i don't think that they're really I think everybody was struggling to do it. You know, I think everybody was struggling to do it. Um, And so I don't, it's, that's, it's hard to say the value is the value is in the best lens that fits anyone's budget. And I think that in the right hands, anything can be a really fantastic lens. So if it were me, especially if I was considering adding a focal length that wasn't my core focal length, I would go for one of those lenses in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. Mm-hmm. And this actually touches on something where, Johnny, I realized I didn't entirely answer your question, uh, the really interesting part of your question, I think it was Johnny's, um, about when Leica moved from, an, uh, uh, from a tool to an object of desire. Right, right. And I think that the un- – that. Newer products like the Fuji products, like some Nikon products, and like these Leica specific lenses um, are starting to are starting to hone in on, on I think Leica's territory. And they say, yeah, n- yeah, your lenses are really fantastic, but look, we can make a lens that does the same thing too. And so now the, the playing field has really been leveled. And I think that the the it was around the the early nineteen fifties. In mid 1950s, when Leica gained a foothold in the United States and started marketing Leica as as a luxury item, not just as the best camera, um, that they started, I just by command, just by asking a ridiculously high price. That's that's when it happened, and that's what did it. Interesting. I think. Yeah. I think. Um, but I think that these all to, to go back, Simon, to your question. I think that the. Um, these lenses are really terrific, and I think that there's no reason to shy away from them unless you are using the Leica camera as a medium format camera to make images that are going to be blown up extremely large and printed or projected. And you absolutely, when you absolutely have to have the best resolution, and you absolutely have to have every effing pixel. That's why you use a Leica lens. But let's be real about it. That's why you use a medium format. Exactly. So, I mean, let's, so let's, call, <laughs> let's be real about it, you know? Yeah. So, you know, people are like, oh, I use Leica because they're the best. Oh, really? Well, if you really use the best, then you would use anything anybody put in your hands and you wouldn't be so bunged up when somebody takes away your Noctilux. So I really do think that there is a, a, a woefully uninformed – and and really terribly elitist view, I think, of Leica and Leica owners, and some of it is brought upon. We brought that upon ourselves, right? right. And so, you know, I'm, I 
as a like a salesman, again, I'm also a little bit of a collector. I'm a collector and all, but you know, just because somebody tells an off color joke, you can't say, well, oh, well, I'm one, I'm one too, so I can tell that joke. No, that's not the case. It's really not. It's, it's either off color or it's not. So like, you know, you know what I mean? Like you're either, you're either, you're either saying what's real or you're not. And so I'm going to say what's real and say that I think a lot of people use Lysa because they just have the money to do it. And it's bling. God bless them. Come Mm -hmm. to Tamark and camera, (laughs) bring your checkbook. I mean, you know, but you know, really what, what I really think is that it's a tool, not a toy. And the Leica for me is the best tool for the job because it's the most familiar. I can bash the thing around and I'm not going to feel bad. I'm not going to break it, um, which I've done with lots of other cameras. And so for me, it's, it's a tool of form follows function. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I, you know, I would, I would agree with that too. It, It would be one thing if they were bling items and, and, and they weren't built to actually be used, but they are actually built to be used that, I mean, that has not changed and they're solid. And I think, you know, it's interesting. We had a conversation with seven artisans. They wanted, you know, they wanted to sell some stuff at central camera. And when we talked to them and we were looking at it and this and that, and one, and you know how Don is, Don is very much about relationships and how things work. And one of Don's questions was when we were talking to seven artisans is, well, what happens when the user needs to have the lens serviced? And their answer was basically, uh, you just get another one. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's really the, when you get down to it, that's the difference. The optics are one thing. Anybody can make the sharp lens now, but right. it's how it's constructed. And they made yeah. no bones about it. It's not a le- They are not building them to a level of quality that you would get with a Leica lens. And they, they, they're, they're really kind of upfront about that. I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm glad yeah. to hear you say that. And I'm glad, I'm glad to learn that. And I'm glad to hear you say it. I'm glad to hear them say it. Yeah. Um, I think that's very true. I think it's, a, uh, I, I mean, I, I haven't had to have one of those lenses service, so I don't know intimately, but I would suspect even before you mentioned it, I kind of suspected that. Yeah. That they're really fantastic lenses for what they are. Right. And I, I, let me, <laughs> let me tell you something about, like uh, about all kinds of old camera, you guys know this already and your listeners know this guys and gals, you know, this already that like, you know, not everything ages perfectly. And when you get an old and sometimes you can get a lens that's got a little separation around the edges and you say, yeah, well, it's character, you know, and, and it's still, it's going to make a beautiful picture. But a lot of like people say, well, I couldn't touch that because uh, it's got separation around the edges. Well, yeah, you get to be 60, 70 years old. You get separation around the edges. Too. <laughs> no, you know, don't be, don't be afraid of a little, of some impurities. You yeah. know? Don't be afraid of, don't be afraid of these kinds of things. You know, oh, is the, is the range, does the range finder have balsam separation? Well, yeah, and so will you at 57 years old too. So just, you know, <laughs> you, you know, roll with it a little bit. And so I, I sometimes, and people, you can find people probably pretty easily who can will tell you. Yeah, sometimes to market can be a little impatient with when when people almost everything that we sell on our website has is flawless in the sense that it's cleaned to the best it can be. Yeah. And the auction's a little bit different, but in the way you know everything is it's just cosmetically graded. We you know everything is fully functional. And when people say, well, is there, you know, does the glass have any bubbles? Like, yeah, glass has bubbles, man. Yeah, That's exactly. how they used to do it. <laughs> you know, or is there any dust? Yes, there's always dust. In all Leica lenses have dust. And I put that question to one of one of the senior um, manufacturer. I don't know what this person's title is, but he's in Vetsar at Leica. And he's an engineer. He's got a bunch of letters after his name. He's a very well-educated and nice fella who I said, please don't be angry at this question, but I really, I got to know why did like lenses have dust inside of them? And he said, quite matter of factly, Oh, it's a byproduct of the manufacturing process. Yeah. That's great. And I said, get, I, you know, I said, done. We are done. Now this question can be put to rest. And if they were completely sealed, they would fog up when you went outside on a chilly autumn morning with your camera. And they would fog up when you came 
when, you know, when you came into the air conditioning from the beach party, which you shouldn't have your Leica at the beach anyway, but the, right. So this is the way optics behave. Yeah. And so when people ask questions about this, I totally understand why they ask these questions, but then you get a little, you got to get a little bit of an education that's of, of what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of. Yeah. You should be afraid of sand, gravity, kids throwing ice cream, fireworks. <laughs> All of these things can have very deleterious effects on your camera equipment. <laughs> but n- just about anything else will not. And so buy from anyone who offers you a return privilege and or a warranty. And if that's a store – Hooray. If it's eBay, if it's, you know, Joey Jojo Shabadoo around the corner or whoever, anybody who's going to treat you right and give you a warranty or a return privilege, buy it, shoot it, enjoy it. Yeah. Great advice. Dan, I think we're, we're coming towards the end of our, of our time, and it's been absolutely a fantastic. Uh, talking to and hearing your stories but I've got one one I don't know if the other guy's got a question but I, I, I think I've yeah. got probably the most important question uh, to be asked other than I'm not going to ask you why I like all cameras crap I'm not I'm not going to ask I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I won't be asking that question because that'll be unfair um, so the, the the question I've got for you is I, I, I have an M2 it, it actually it's currently on loan uh, to a chap called Gilbert Townsend and in, in return I'm lending I'm borrowing his uh, Contacts G2 which is pretty mm. much the, be- the, the best range finder for 35mm uh, that kind of ever. style of ever yeah, well, we, we, all, we all agree with that everybody knows that yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway we'll put, pushing that one to one side as well um, the, the winder on the, oh, yeah. on the on the M2, and I, I guess it's uh, it's probably the same on the M on the M3. It's 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 wonderful. I love to fondle it. It's it's a thing of beauty. Yeah. Um, but I held a, an M6 uh, not that long ago, and I noticed that the the winder it's articulated and it's got yes. plastic on it, and it's horrible. And I just wonder, <laughs> did Leica change the design because somebody pointed out that the older style Leica looked like? Um, the older style winder looked like a penis. Yes, almost certainly. Almost certainly. <laughs> I don't know. I would love to have been a fly on the wall in that <laughs> meeting. Um, I think I do think that it probably came up. I think <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I I really I do. I think that the articulated advanced lever is indeed terrible. I think that they did that in part because ergonomics were the order of the day and plastics yeah. made things that made all of our lives better, didn't they? And um, I, I think that they did it just because it was the next thing to do. And only when people really, really looked at it did they realize <laughs> – that they screwed the pooch on that one. It's like VHS and Betamax. Like Betamax is a much better product. Y'all just y'all just went the wrong way. Um, yeah. I agree with you. And in fact, a local photographer here, um, I just love Instagram. I'm not so nutty about Facebook, but I love Instagram. And a local photographer here who is all over Instagram um, and uh, uh, Corona Creative. He's really a great photographer. And he's going to have his lever on his M camera switched because he made that discovery recently oh, nice. too. And I hope it's okay that I'm calling him out on that because it's a really – it's like one of those things. When you're a serious shooter, like when you're really using the thing as a tool, you discover pretty quickly. Or I think – I mean it's a matter of taste. But a lot of people discover really quickly, wow, that advanced lever is crap. Yeah. I mean it's still – it's better than – I mean you got to have it. It's better than nothing. You know, you'd be using your teeth otherwise. But, it, <laughs> but yeah, it's better than nothing. But it really the old style one that is kind of phallic is – it's better. It's just better all the way around. Well, they've got it on the MP. And they've got it on the MP. Yes, exactly. That's right. I mean there's a reason that they do some of those retro things I think. And Wait, like so – Yeah. Are they interchangeable? Like, so if you have an M4, could you put an M3 advanced lever on that? Yeah. And it would... Uh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's, it's, it, the, M7, the M7 is different. The M6 TTL might be different, too. I have to... I would have to... I would have to remind myself and look look up in there. But, yeah, you definitely can. And we have a trade-in program <laughs> where you can trade in your old <laughs> M6 lever. Um, 
to your articulated M4, M6 lever, M4P lever towards another lever. But I got to say they're expensive. I got to tell you, it's mm-hmm. not they're not cheap. I, I want to say they're a couple hundred, couple, two hundred and fifty dollars installed or something like that. They're not they're not cheap. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of modding and customization. You know, you can you can pimp your ride. You know, I mean, I have a, right. I have a friend who has a, who has she has an M3 and she has um, she bedazzled it and she has pink leatherette, pink vulcanite on it. Wow. And she, the name it's Marilyn the M3 and she took it took it out of the bag and she's like, oh, you're gonna hate this. Oh, you're not gonna. I was like, oh, that is awesome. This is terrific. <laughs> Let me take a picture. Let me take a picture. Um, yeah, yeah, it's super cool. And she bedazzled it and has pink leather, a pink alligator skin leather. I mean, it's really, it's both horrible and beautiful at once. <laughs> I love it. I love it when people pimp their rides, man. I think it's great. No reason why not. Have you, have you seen Johnny's uh, Blue Bessa? Ooh, I haven't seen that. Yeah, I have a, <laughs> so yeah, it's a Bessa R um, that's blue. They they made a they made a blue blue ones and olive ones for the Japanese market. It came oh. it came, it came in the central camera. We got a collection of all this stuff. This guy had you know it, one of those collections that's the kind you want where yeah. people bought it, didn't use it. It's not it, it's not moldy and fungusy from sitting in a closet. It was just beautiful. Yeah. So it came it came in and I'm like oh I gotta have this thing. Yoink. So yep. I tra- I traded in some other I traded Don for some other stuff and I've got my blue Bessa. It's the Batman Bessa. I put a Batman sticker on it. Oh, I saw. <laughs> yeah, I love that camera. I saw that camera. Yeah. yeah. Now that you say that, now that yeah. you say that, of course I know that camera. That's great. <laughs> um, yeah. Dan, I, I do have one more question for you. Shoot. I don't know if you have any insight into this. What are the chances you think of Leica resurrecting the a la carte program? And I ask this only because I missed the like June seventh cutoff date last year because I didn't want to pay the money because they're expensive. But I realized in hindsight that like a black paint MP with M2 frame lines is my dream, <laughs> my dream camera. And I'm like, damn it, I, I, I can't get one now. And I asked my local shopkeeper who did MP orders. He was like, oh, yeah, I think that's the best configuration as well. But no one gets it because they all get the full frame lines with like 75 inside 50. Yeah. And so I'm just wants, like, yeah. I'm tearing my hair off. I want an MP, but I specifically want that. Well, first but of I, all, I think that like it's easy enough to adjust the frame lines. So like – we we pretty frequently have cameras that we call pro specials. Like when people take frame lines out, the Leica M cameras can 28 and 90 appear together, 15 and 75 appear together and, and 35 and 135 appear together and people can remove the frame lines. And, it, and it's, it's kind of cool. Um, yeah. You know, I think, first of all, I wouldn't count the a la carte program completely dead. Um, I mean, I think that from an advertising and from a public standpoint yeah it's no more but it kind of depends on who you know and let's just say um you know a guy you got a guy (laughs) you got a guy it's hard to say leica is a quirky company um it's hard to say what they'll do and what they won't i will tell you a flashback to what 1998 or whatever it was when the sultan of brunei said gee, I think I'd like 100 Leicas in solid gold. And Leica said, dude, we're on that. So <laughs> I think it's a little hard to say, you know, never say never. I, I think that if the if there was enough of an interest in any one thing, I, I think that you can – it will appear. It will appear. And also, I well, I, I, let me be perfectly frank. We don't monkey around with serial numbers or the factory seal Mm. that some cameras have okay we don't monkey around with that ever at all ever but i would have no problem handing handing over to you a a nice brassed up m2 top plate and and fixtures and having some place i understand there's an excellent company in japan that repaints beautifully um and if you once you take a camera down to brass it's going to brass up when you enamel it. It's going to brass up just like a Leica MP. You save three, four thousand dollars and take your sweetie on vacation. That's the best plan of all. <laughs> That's the best plan of all. Dan, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on. Man, I could talk with you guys all day. Really, yeah. I, 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 I hope I answered your questions. I hope that we will meet in person 
one day soon and we can we can hash out this why like is there such crap question <laughs> 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 Dan, as we wrap up, which I'm sure Simon is going to say this too, but I, I want to make sure you have a huge opportunity to plug the upcoming auction. Um, because a lot of us, I know me personally, I always look forward to the catalog just to look through everything. It's amazing. Oh, yeah. So I guess as we wrap up here, if you want to, if you want to talk a bit about the auction and when that's going to be and maybe how it works a little bit like that, that would be, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to. Thanks for the opportunity. It's actually, um, uh, uh, so, I, so I'm Tamarkin. I'm Dan Tamarkin. My website is tamarkin.com. Um, we also we're on Instagram as Tamarkin Chicago. I'm actually got to go to my Instagram and make sure that's right. Make sure I give you the right address. But w- every November, our sister company, um, yeah, Tamarkin Chicago is our Instagram handle. Um, and every November, our sister company, Tamarkin Auctions, which began in 1995 or 1996. And is the oldest um, auction house in the Western Hemisphere that's dedicated to Leicas and Photographica. Every November, we hold our rare camera auction. We produce a catalog, which we're in production for now. Saturday, November 14th is the auction date. Um, Because of the pandemic, it's going to happen almost entirely virtually. Uh, But you can follow Leica Shop Chicago to learn more. TamarkinAuctions.com. You can email me, Dan at Tamarkin.com, um, or connect with any of the fellows here on this podcast, and I'm sure we can all uh, connect one another. Yeah. Um, we are open. We're a retail store as well, and we're open by appointment, and we encourage people to connect with us in whatever way you prefer. Um, and we're going to have, I think it's 395 lots. We're going to have a, 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 a 150 millimeter Hugo Meyer Gorlitz screw mount lens. I don't know anything about this lens. It's a really interesting lens. Wow. We're going to have a hammer tone Leica set, which is a few numbers earlier than the Lights Wetzlar auction that just ended last year for 130,000 euro. Um, there's uh, Leica L Maxes, there's an Anastigmat camera extremely rare and early Leica cameras. Um, lots of non Leica stuff. We've got tons of Roly, um, weird, weird lenses like the 55 Luminar, some Ingenue lenses that have been made for the um, Leica, M, uh, Leica screw mount that were Alpa a- Alatar lenses, exceedingly rare. So it's a lot of really rare and interesting stuff. And you can always visit Tamarkin Camera. You can always visit Tamarkin Auctions just to visit and experience what all we do. You don't have to bring your checkbook. So don't worry about, oh, I can't do that because I'll spend too much money. No, no, no. Just come around and see what we got going on. Like a shop Chicago on the Instagram for the auction and to mark in Chicago for, uh, um, for to And we're, we're, Super stoked to have to widen the family that is Leica and is all things Photographica. So please don't be shy. Awesome, awesome. awesome. Uh, that's that's absolutely brilliant. And I I just want to uh, thank uh, a couple of people that that have donated to the show uh, since last time. And that's uh, Lawrence Dunn, and we've also got uh, Nigel Cliff, who has also left a message, and uh, he said. Uh, the comment uh, that more shows have been made without Carl than with Carl was very poignant, uh, which was, <laughs> yes, yeah, it certainly was. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for, for, for those people that have um, helped us out that way. Um, Perry, uh, how can people keep up with the kind of stuff that you get on with? Uh, you can find me on Instagram most of the time uh, and Flickr at Perry G, P-E-R-R-Y-G-E. And Johnny? Um, I, you know, I feel like I'm going to be shamed back into getting on Instagram because I've been off for so long. And also I'd really like to, uh, be Instagramming my car project, uh, since I've got so many of those coming out here lately with the, with the 20 millimeter Roussard lens. So maybe I'll be back on Instagram, but I'm on there as a system photography right now and come say hi to me on my porch here in Chicago, since you can't visit me at central camera currently. Um, and I wanted to give one quick shout out. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Tim at Filter Find. Uh, we've talked about Tim before. He's 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 a great source to go to for filters if you don't necessarily want to go onto eBay. And he has a lot of great stuff. And I was talking to him about twenty nine point five 
screw in filters for uh my, yeah for for my uh tele arton so my dkl lens my kodak dkl lens um and they made a very specific filter for that lens because it has a long minimum focus distance and so i was talking with him about it and he's like no nah, i've never even seen one of those um he said but i've got this nice set of 29.5 screw in filters you can have them if you want i'll send them to you so he sent me this great set it's like a one two three set typical um uh attachment diopter kind of set and they work great and as expected they work just fine uh with that uh with that lens i just i suspect that the filter that was made specifically for that lens was to exactly pick up the shortest focal range the shortest you know point focus point of focus to make it closer and there's a little gap in between but uh, it otherwise they work flawlessly so if you've got one of those lenses, like the 135 DKL lens, you can pick these up and shorten your minimum focus distance. And it's no longer this big issue on those lens that you've got, you know, a, a 30 foot minimum focus distance. <laughs> so it works just fine. So thank you to, to Tim at Filter Find for confirming that and for sending off uh, a set of filters. I can't wait to try these out. Well, I'm just, just thinking that because it's a bit remiss of me uh, because I should have done shout outs before we did uh, contacts and things like that. So, uh, Dan, have you got any shout outs you want to, you want to give? You know, thanks for asking. I'm just, I got to say, I'm, I think you guys and the Chicago community in general, um, you know, I, I, I urge you to shoot more and connect more. Um, I'm just, I'm grateful to everybody here in Chicago and in particular, um, the Instagram community, uh, and I just can't, there's so many names, please get on, get on Instagram or find a way to connect with your local, local people. And, and let's all get together. I really, I really want to keep this sense of community going. Let's get together again. And maybe Johnny, let's do a Chicago meetup on your front porch. Absolutely, man. That'd be great. Love to do it. Uh, Perry, have you got any shout outs? Um, I do have a, another quick shout out, uh, to my repair guy here, uncle Tat, um, because I, I, his hands are pretty full right now. He's, he's, uh, CLAing a 50 Sumicron for me. Um, he's looking at my M3's jammed, uh, film advance. He's trying to replace a synchro comper, uh, mm-hmm. shutter blades in a, in a folding camera. Um, and that leads on to the, uh, second shout out. Um, something else I'm going to be bringing to him. Uh, shout out to listener Anu Jindal, who is in New York, um, and we've been chatting quite a bit on and off, and he has a broken uh, Voigtlander Vitessa with a 50 Ultron lens that would basically cost more to uh, service than to replace. So he had this brick sitting on his shelf, and um, he asked me if I wanted it, so... And I was like, hell yeah, you know, I, I <laughs> paid shipping and sent it over from New York when it was safe to go to the post office. And, I mean, apart from the shutter and the rangefinder being screwed, the thing is in beautiful condition. So I can't bring myself to kill it and rip the lens off, which was the original <laughs> plan. i will bring it to Tad first and see if he can bring it back to life Oh, nice. uh, before I attempt to remount that lens. That's fantastic. Hey, I do, I do actually have one, one request, if I, if I may. Um, a lot of what I, a lot of what we do is restoring and bringing back to life, um, like a cameras and lenses. And so if you or any of your listeners, um, have a repair service that is interested in gaining more business, mm. uh, I would love to have to widen our circle of folks who do repairs on, uh, on Leica cameras and lenses. And so I would uh, open it up. And I'm, we're always interested in contracting with more people near and far to do service for us. So if anybody's looking for that kind of work, we've got it. Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, that, that's good. Uh, and uh, I've got a shout out uh, as well, because uh, last night uh, I did a, an interview with Graham Jago with the Sunday 16 podcast, although it wasn't actually Jeremy. For, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Jeremy Jago. Um, and uh, but it wasn't actually for the Sunday 16 podcast. It was for their spin-off uh, series, uh, which is uh, Sunday 16 Presents, where the individual um, hosts uh, make their own shows. And so this was uh, a solo effort, uh, if you like. And uh, also Sunday 16 Presents, it's on a different uh, feed to the regular Sunday 16 podcast, so you have to go and uh, look for it. Uh, but it's also one that, 
Um, they take in submissions for people that want to say things about cameras or photography uh, in wow. general. And if you if you want to like do a like a not so much an audio diary, although it could be an audio diary, but if you want to do if you've got something that you really want to tell the world about, and you don't want your own podcast to do it, and you just want to just get the word out about things, then they're taking submissions and they'll happily put it out on their channel. Oh, so cool. uh, so that's uh, Sunny Sixteen presents. Um, so thanks to Graham on that one. I think that it might be coming out tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow being Tuesday. Um, then again, it might be coming out later, or it might come out in a few years. But Graham's not the most organised person in the world at the moment, so um, it will come out eventually. Uh, but it's uh, just a heads up. It's me talking more about large format than it says talk about uh, lenses and cameras and things like that. Um, so you've been warned. Um, yeah. um, we did have, uh, well, we do have a couple of emails, um, and they, we're going to do those uh, next week with 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 a bit with a bit of luck. So uh, thanks for sending those in, and please do send more emails into us at uh, I was going to say Sunday Sixteen Podcast at Gmail dot com. <laughs> no, that's where you if you want to get yourself onto Sunday Sixteen, that's where you that's the email for that one. Um, but it's uh, what is our email address, Johnny? It is Classic Lenses Podcast at Gmail dot com. And of course, the website is classiclensespodcast.com. Um, and the other place I always mention where you can see the podcast, I guess you can read the captions while you listen to the podcast is on YouTube. But I would say if you're going on YouTube, a much better idea would be to go check out Dan's videos because they are freaking awesome. <laughs> yes. so, oh, good. Thank you. so go do that. You can find us, but go actually watch Dan's videos. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, guys. Definitely. Uh, th- 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 thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. And uh, just one, one more thing for um, uh, links and things like that. Uh, best Vintage Lens on Instagram. Uh, yes. That's the, we, don't, we don't have our own Instagram account, but we're aff- affiliated uh, with Best Vintage Lens. Um, so um, if you correct, if you correct. take some cool photos with, uh, with bocalicious lenses and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> um, then uh, Best Vintage Lens is a great place to... to Featured, have them featured and do competitions and all, all these wonderful things um, uh, I've not given any contact details for myself, I'm on Twitter as Simon4 I'm on Instagram as Simon Forster Photographic, which is also the name of my website uh, with co.uk on the end of that where you can buy my uh, handcrafted lens caps made out of plastic um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, I'm doing more accessories for uh, the Hamish Gills Pixelator. Um, so there's ways of uh, di- to help you digitise um, uh, fit your film um, using using the camera. Uh, so there's a few things I'm working on there that are going to make it easier for people uh, to to do that. Um, so I think that's just about it. Our music is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com, and uh, so. I hope you've enjoyed this week's show, and if you can, be like Carl.